quarterfinals, and we gave them snacks, pencils, and water, and just a friend to be there, because, you know, sometimes the finals. <laughs> and then we also have our school spirit. We wouldn't be ASB without our amazing school spirit. Um, our, uh, as you can see, there is our school spirit. It was our first uh, football game where we had red, white, and blue. And we just really find the school spirit to be really welcoming and more involvement with the students. We feel that it is just a good way for the students to have fun in such a stressful environment that it is sometimes can be. And it's just a great way to like get some stress out and dress up as crazy as you can. <laughs> and then our most important thing is student involvement. We want to make sure that students can be involved in many different activities we um, have after school, such as API, DSU, cooking club, adventure club, all those different types of clubs we um, have that only we want to make sure that there's anything for anyone that you can try new things, be who you are, show your student pride, just show who yourself, show who you are within, within your school. Thank you. Uh, and just what Jenny said about our school spirit, we really like that the students engage in our student spirit and we kind of have a little thing going on at the beginning of the year. Our ASB created the Kleenex, uh, Olympic Kleenex, and uh, like saying was only $20. There's a lot, there's a lot of it. <laughs> then we had our freshman info day. I thought it was really successful. And ASB, we did our fours and classes. Teachers set up um, tables just to be more um, open for students and families and welcoming to them to look for more courses. And then we had our homecoming spirit week. I thought it was a blast. We had like bring anything as a backpack day. Saw some talking parts. Oh. Don't know if that was legal. Yeah. <laughs> it was really successful though. Loved it. Um, we had our ghost the musical too. Really, really amazing. I watched it. You did too? <laughs> yeah, I thought it was fantastic. Um, also, just our whole art department is fantastic. And Mr. McFigure and Mr. Williams, just amazing teachers. And then the last thing we have is the, the uh, Spoken Truth, the History Traveling Museum. I was able, and a lot of members that are here today, that we were able to experience it too with um, our Harvard students and CK students. Um, it was really um, educational for uh, students of color. And yeah, that was it. So what we are doing next um, at Olympic High School, um, our project is coming up. Uh, we are really focusing on setting it up to be very formal, very nice. We have our juniors set it up. Um, we are holding it at the Bremerton Mansion Center. Um, we thought that was a very, we thought it was a pretty good place to go. It's open, it's on the water, it's very nice. I'm very excited for it. For it. Um, our next, uh, our next fundraiser for the seniors. It's Soka Senior, and we have, we have prizes uh, for them, and which is the dunk. Um, I bet you AJ is excited. <laughs> uh, just today, we have Hide of Presidents, uh, which is always a fun thing at lunches. Everyone always loves it. Nice. <laughs> loves it. It's always a good time with Hide of Presidents. Um, Holy Night, um, our last Holy Night, it wasn't um, as successful, we're going to be honest, uh, but for our next one, we're going to grow. We're going to learn what we can do better next time for games. This time we'll have the gym open. We can have a lot more games included, which uh, a lot of people are looking forward to. If we didn't have it, it's all right. We're going to learn. We're going to move on. And the next only night will be a lot more successful. And then moving up, uh, assembly. That's been a, that's been a tradition uh, where the seniors, it's just our normal pep assembly. Um, the seniors will leave. Then the juniors will then take their spot on our bleachers, where they usually are in the prep assembly. And then sophomores take the junior spots, and then freshmen will take the sophomore spot. Thank you. Okay, before we close off the presentation, I'd like to uh, read out Mr. Wilson's mission statement, which is, Olympic High School is a community where everyone belongs. We aim to develop knowledgeable students with strong character, confidence, and motivation to be contributing citizens. While being supported and engaged in relevant and rigorous courses, every Olympic high school student will be prepared for the most high school success 
for formulating an active plan for college or career pathway. Although I'm a senior, I'm pretty excited to see what Olympic does. Like, I'm so excited. I'm sure that the upcoming freshmen and our current underclassmen will love to see what Olympic does. Uh, oh, like, well done. Um, um, I don't know, Dr. Prince, like, I think you guys were doing a slide about freshmen um, in Phone I, I So I have um, I have twins who will be freshmen only next year. And they came home, my husband came home glowing from that freshman info night. So, um, like, as a parent, I thank you. Um, I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> and I, and I, I bragged about it at my last meeting. You did. Um, but I, so just like, thank you. So they felt your energy and your positivity. And just, and um, I'm hoping that all the other freshmen who were there did also those families, but um, mine did. So, so thank you for your efforts in that. And just, yes, it's, you can feel your guys' excitement. Um, and thank you for being honest about your know, last only night wasn't as successful as you'd hoped. And that, that's what, all we can ask, right? Is that we learn and we try to do better. You know, that's what we're doing also. We're trying to learn from, you know, something that doesn't go how we wanted it to, but we learn and we um, do better than next time. So I, I appreciate that. And you guys love Else for I, I had yeah. a very similar comment to Denise. Uh, great presentation. I love hearing about the successes and the stumbling blocks. Uh, that's uh, an excellent adult skill that you are developing now and recognizing where things you know may have gone askew and how you're going to uh, work on that. So fantastic job and thank you for sharing the successes and the stumbling blocks. Hello. 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 I, I really applaud the local and, and school. That is like a major part because many uh, students, you know, they just maybe sit in front and they're not engaged. But I can tell by all of your spirit that, you know, that will force that. Like, hey, come over here. <laughs> and to know that, uh, you know, you're there for, you know, and, and, and supporting that, that is so, so important that you're doing it for your fellow students. So I just look forward uh, for everything that you guys are doing. And please keep it up because your spirit resonate uh, with it, you know, definitely. And I know I, I'm definitely trying to go to the movement up also. So I'm going to date and try to be here for that. I just, I just am glowing with pride. You know, um, these are our future leaders, adults in the room, and uh, just gives such hope. And uh, we were, three of us, Director Tracy and Director Green and myself, we were at Bowling today. And uh, your principal, Wilson, said, Every time Dr. Prince you come to Lowell, we have some sort of spirit going on. And so I know, I know that I, I don't know whether it was Easter, I'm not sure what it was. Oh, I know what was today. Oh, I was right. Yeah, but you guys weren't even alive. And, uh, Spears, Spears, but maybe uh, yeah, there are listening Britney Spears, but I passed on that one. Um we listened to student voice with the polls, and uh, they represented you well as a as a community of learners, a community of inclusion, and how important it is at Holy that everyone feels they belong. And you started off with that in your presentation as well, and you can feel it when I walk through the doors of Holy. Um, you as students always greet with a smile. You do value everyone feeling welcome, and so I just want you to know as an adult. And as superintendent, I'm just really proud of the climate that you are developing and you expect as students because that's what makes the change for sure. So thank you for your energy and I'm very excited for Oli and very excited for you and your future as you know as you uh, venture out. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, next up we have the progress to graduation. Uh, Ms. Burrow. I know, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, it is after spring break. And that means uh, round one of progress and graduation. Very exciting time. Uh, spring is in the air, sun is in the air, and graduation is in the air. So, 
will go forward with. Or just as a quick reminder, what the kids are under diploma, 24 credits, a high school beyond plan, and complete a graduation pathway. And so I always, um, at this time of the year, we'd like to give you just a snapshot. Um, where is the senior class in terms of credits? And I kind of phrase this in terms of, are they in striking distance? Um, they're all, you know, majority of seniors have six classes, so they could earn three credits this term. So we, we do a quick run on uh, how are seniors at 21 credits. And, and you can see there, um, that, that's all very positive. The majority of the senior class on their traditional high schools are all within striking distance. We go to the next slide, and we always will we'll bring to you by race and ethnicity, just some, some breakdown there. So may not graduate, this, this slide here is just due to credits. So you can see some numbers there. What you don't see is, and, and all of these numbers are uh, a lot of staff, uh, families too, as you know, we have two leaders that uh, helping students get across the finish line. So there are counselors, staff, and administrators, and support staff, they're all helping students on this slide and, and the other numbers uh, to make it to June to walk across the stage. So there are plans in place um, so that, that right there, those numbers are more just a, a mathematical equation, but we've got lots of plans uh, to help students, uh, plenty of time now, and we know how team leaders are, sometimes they're scrambling and uh, pulling things together last minute, so we're, we're doing that right now. Next slide. In terms of pathways, this, is, this has been in play for three or four years. You can see we currently have eight pathways. Um, those of you who have been tracking at the state level, there's a ninth pathway that will come into play next year. Um, so the, the class needs to complete one of these. Just to give you context, every student that graduated last year completed a pathway. Pathway has not been an obstacle or barrier. You'll see on the waiver slide that, that we can do a waiver, but that hasn't been necessary for us historically. This, this, this part we can take care of. And, and so this gives you a snapshot of just where that's at. 746 of the cohort have completed a pathway. And you see we've got a couple hundred that that's in progress right now. That could be um, some testing they're doing this spring. It could also be a course they're enrolled in, things like that. So again, I wanted to just check. So waivers, um, and this also has been changed the last few years. We've had the local waiver option for a while. And um, I'm misplacing the year, but um, at least for the last, I think, three, the one on the right there, the, the state level emergency waiver has been in play. Uh, students still need to graduate with a minimum of 20 credits. Uh, the pathway can be waived. So the high school and beyond plan is still a requirement also that, that everyone has to take. So the way ahead, like I mentioned, lots of amazing staff um, in all different roles and, and family helping students uh, fourth quarter. We do have, I always remind, we have summer options. So you can graduate and still be a class uh, of the cohort of 2023 and graduate in July and August. So every once in a while that happens. Uh, and it, if not, we still have summer options to keep working on accruing and retrieving credit. Um, and we also have enrollment options. We have students that stay with us for a fifth year um, and have to do support. Graduation ceremonies, very excited to, we're in the midst of planning those again at, at home sites and everybody claps their fingers for good weather. <laughs> and, uh, everyone's excited about that. So I'll be back at the end of June to do kind of where did we land, uh, a little of all of the experience graduations, but I'll bring back the numbers and, and how, how our graduates did. Any questions? Yeah, I want to point out that I love the fact um, that you said that parents uh, and the, the teachers are working together to, to do that. Um, Neither of mine was saying that, that, you know, one of, one of our children, they get ready to graduate, but it's, it's for some reason it's just a lot. But how the teacher just reached out to her and gave us some tools, like, hey, let, you know, let's do this uh, to get a moment. So I really appreciate that because that, I think that's critical because a lot of times parents are trying to figure it out too, you know, so to hear that, that was big, you know, it was for bringing that, that connection up. Yeah, right. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, our next uh, item is extracurricular uh, update for the standings.
Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, we are going to dive into the winter update um, over athletics. So just real quick, uh, we always start going over our athletic participation numbers. Um, you can see here we have about 380 high school student athletes that participated in winter sports. Uh, the numbers are broken down there for you by each school. Um, one thing I want to point out, I pointed at this out in the fall as well, we actually are continuing to see an increase in participation numbers. Uh, this winter we had an additional 56 high school student athletes participate, um, which is in line with where our fall participation numbers were this year as well from last year. Um, and we're right back to where we were pre-pandemic numbers. Um, you have additional information in your packet there for you, but you can see that in 2019 and 20, we had about 381 high school athletes participating in winter sports. All right, some highlights for you guys. Uh, CK High School, their girls basketball team finished fourth in the league this year, and they also qualified for districts and advanced out of districts and moved on to regionals. Uh, boys swim qualified two relay teams in the 200 and 400 relays uh, for state. Bowling went undefeated in league, finished second in districts and fifth in state. We had five wrestlers qualify for state and Carter Chadwick was named the WSWCA, which is the Washington State Wrestling Coaches Association Academic State Champ. So great success this winter for CK High School. Uh, Clahalia, their bowling team won the academic state championship this year. And I just wanna note that uh, this is Clahalia Bullying is this is their award. They have been claiming the state academic <laughs> championship award since 2017-18, every year since then. Um, and they also uh, won this title with a team GPA of 3.69, and they finished fourth in the state. Uh, Lucy Mitchell finished second overall in the state bowling tournament, and Haley Johnson finished sixth overall. They also sent nine wrestlers to state and Logan Wallace placed fourth at state. All right, the Olympic High School. Uh, they had a total of four wrestlers qualifying for state. And you can see here a picture of Allie there holding up a number one. You guys remember last year we celebrated Allie Templeton who finished second at state. Well, she came back this year and she won the state championship for the girls 1A, 2A, uh, 120 pound weight class. Um, let's see, the, both the boys and girls basketball teams qualified for districts this year, and the girls advanced to the second round of district. They also had one bowler qualify for state, and they sent 13 boy swimmers to state. This is something that I'm highlighting this year, and I stuck this slide in in our fall, and I really wanted to bring more attention to it. You will see it in my June report as well. Um, but we are educational-based athletics. Our student athletes are students first and foremost. So it's really important to me to um, acknowledge the success that our athletes are having in the classroom. So out of our winter programs, we had 10 winter programs that were awarded the Distinguished Team Award, meaning they had an average team GPA of 3.0 to 3.49. We had four outstanding team awards, so uh, teams that average GPA of a 3.5 to a 4.0. And then of course that one academic state championship, which was Clahalia. So 15 total scholastic awards this winter for our high school teams. All right, middle school um, athletics. Uh, this is combined data for winter one and two season. Their total participation came in at 468 student athletes. Again, same trend. This is an increase of about 35 athletes um, from last year's winter data. And same along with, we saw these same results in the fall, we're just continuing to trend up and we're back to where we were in our pre-COVID um, numbers. Um, and again, you have that additional data in your packet. And these are just some photos from CK Middle School and Ridgetop in the different sports and participation numbers. And then we have another slide there with Fairview and Clahalia. All right, so PE and community connections. This is something that we're trying to emphasize in the athletic world, especially at the high school level. Coming out of COVID, going from having no um, fans in our sporting events, whether they were in the gym or outdoors, 
and now trying to really enhance and connect with PV in the community. So we have three different photos here, just to give you some examples. On the far left, you can see um, at CK High School during the football game, they had a youth PV night there, and you can see the PV players lined up. Up top at Clahalia, you can see there was a mini cheer camp they had, and I believe they had over 100 uh, youth cheerleaders sign up for that camp. And then down below, this is a picture of the Ole basketball camp they had over winter break. As I mentioned, these are just some of the examples. Um, some other examples, there's been baseball and softball clinics that were held over spring break, summer volleyball and basketball camps, youth nights at basketball and football games. We've even had some programs take it as far as inviting our youth teams in to watch practices. So our coaches have really done a great job of trying to connect with our PV and our community, and we're looking forward to continue to enhance um, these connections that we're making with them. Okay, when I was here last time, I had talked about upcoming um, spring coach training. We are really trying to give our coaches more in-house training. That was something that we had heard back from our coaches uh, when we provided our first in-person coach training in August. So we provided another opportunity this spring. Um, we had 30 coaches join us for that training this spring. Um, and at the training, we had a guest speaker, the head football coach from PLU, spoke around the importance of continuity within programs, as well as within the coaching staff. We offered six breakout sessions at that training for coaches. Um, topics varied anywhere from ASD fundraising to the importance of preseason meetings. Um, we're going to continue to expand next year on the opportunities that we're offering, not only in person, but looking at adding some online training options for our coaches as well. And we're taking feedback. We're receiving feedback not only from the August training, but we've also been getting feedback from the March. And I wanted to share a couple of those comments from coaches. Um, I enjoyed having coaches from everywhere involved. It was nice to hear from coaches all over the district and what they're doing for their athletes. All of the presenters and information was amazing. It was beneficial having small groups in each breakout room to be able to have conversations, not only with presenters, but other coaches as well. I would like to see some sort of alignment between middle and high school. It would be nice to hear what the high school coaches are wanting their athletes to do. At the middle school level, we focus on basic skills, but if we can better prepare for high school sports, maybe our programs can improve. So we're continuing to hear like that networking, connecting with other districts in our, or other coaches in our district, excuse me, is really important and valuable to them. So we're gonna continue to kind of feed off of that and see how we can continue to create opportunities for them to network and really connect with their middle school counterparts. Um, this slide is really a thank you to our school board. I wanted to take the time to thank you guys for your support and acknowledge all the work that we've done at the um, Olympic Aquatic Center. Um, and we also couldn't do it without Whitney Dodd, who's our current, our current pool coordinator. She's been extremely committed and hardworking, um, and she's helped us lead in opening, reopening our pool. Because if you remember, um, it was closed during construction and part of COVID. Um, and so it's been a really big lift. And I just quickly wanted to tell you a few of the things that we have done during that time. Um, a new pro pool circulation pump has been installed, a helper pump, chem controller system, a flow meter, and almost the entire facility has been repainted. We have new signs and new school banners hanging in the facility. We have new uh, swim lesson program curriculum and we've updated our swim lesson that's now all available online for registration. Um, and we've added an intro to swim team program, which is really targeting that middle school age um, student. So then we can try to help build our high school swim programs at all, as well. Um, and then also we're currently seeing a, a, um, an increase in our rentals. And right now we have rentals anywhere from the Special Olympics program to scuba diving to kayaking. We've hosted um, rather large club swimming. So we're really excited about the work that's being done at the pool. Um, and I would love to give you guys a tour if you have time and want to take me up on that offer. I would love to get you out there and show you our uh, revamped facility. So thank you again for all of your support. Well, thank you. Anybody? I, I, I want to say this one, the, the PV connection you know, I talked about, I, I love it because um, what I had said at uh, one of the associations uh, events, small small event, 
that they become our children, you know, so we honor the inherent in us. So it's always good to make that connection there. And I think that there's more that we can do with our Peewees as far as programs that we have that can allow our students to work with Peewees as well uh, and making those connections. So I'm glad that that's happening in, in, in that space that it is. And then I think the coaching, I, I sound like my, my great friend over there, Eric, now, with having a son playing two sports and your future child, your children play as well, right? So I, I really, the coach part of it is so important, you know, because uh, my son did not want to play uh, sports country, he did not want to run it. And I was like, well, you know, he needs to do it. And whatever the coach did over there, I didn't, you know, I didn't bother with it, but he bought in and he's like, I love it. And then he's like, all right, I got it. Yeah, you know, still, but it's gonna be shame. But it's, he'll excuse it out. <laughs> but it, it, it's it's really that that connection is what it is, and he, he and I know it's the coach. You know, it's not just the sport itself. So thanks for that that training because they are the, the other part of us uh, as parents to say, hey, we we got we got your child. So thank you for that. I just got a. They're called uniforms. You got one. I didn't know. Um, or is it, this is a, did you actually, I guess a while ago I had asked around um, individuals that wanted to contribute to the upgrade of facilities yeah. and how we went about doing that. I just hadn't heard anything about that, but what the process was if people wanted, for example, I think it would be a photo at, at a, yeah. at Clarion. That's because yeah. what I understand it's also some work around the softball field. Um, where people wanted to contribute, uh, you know, licensed folks wanted to contribute up uh, services and the like to, to improve those facilities and how we went about doing that. And then I, the, the conversation that uh, Dr. Chris and I had was can there be a way to put together some budgets just so we can say, hey, this is what the number is? So this way that, that is specific to that, so it comes in, we know that that's the number uh, that, that we had. So I think that uh, we had a small conversation. In regards to that, I do believe that that's uh, in the works for the Arkansas State Assembly. But that, when you said that the last time, I said the same thing. We got to know what that number is. So this way, when we say it, we say, hey, this is what uh, it may be at. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. It's okay. Um, <laughs> we got excited. <laughs> um, so, obviously, right now, we have high school spring sports that started at the end of February. They're in full swing. Um, we just are so happy that the sunshine, that big uh, foreign object in the sky has returned um, because we are able to get all of our sports up and running. Um, and then middle school sports also are in full swing, cross country, football, volleyball, and cheer. And then my last slide for you is just uh, a reminder that I'll be back um, in May and we'll celebrate our state bound athletes from winter. And then we do have high school participation. Summer participation starts right up at the end of May. So we close out uh, spring and we have about one, two, three days off. And then we go right into high school summer participation. And then I'll be back in June and I will do a full year review. And that will include activities and then celebration of our spring athletes. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I talked to the superintendent this afternoon about the possibility of of the study session or part of the study session um, moving forward with, with respect to, uh, I think we, for the levy, we grouped them up as, as athletics activities and, and arts. Um, so sort of a presentation around that, respect to a um, little bit about budget, a little bit about goals and objectives and what we're looking to do around that, what the, kind of what the expectation is. Just to bring to bring the board because we have a lot of new membership on the board and to bring the community up to speed, kind of the first first opportunity to start talking about those kind of things as we move forward. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. And, and I think uh, I, I say great job because we're uh, going to the championships and I think we we're not going to win some whole summer. <laughs> so thank, yeah, they're, thank they're you. They're coming in. Thank exactly. You thank you. Bye. You know that when you know someone, you're like, yeah, that's one I understand. <laughs> All right. Ah, oh, so we have legislative report. Take a deep breath. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I made it much briefer this time. <laughs> yeah, that's all relevant. Exactly. <laughs> so the session is over. Yeah.
so I am wrapping up the bills that we have been tracking. Uh, so anything that had died in committee by the last time we met is fallen off the report. So we will start with our special ed bills. Um, Senate, the Senate bill died in the Senate Rules Committee. The House bill, however, passed the Senate on April 22nd and was signed by the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate on the 23rd. And now we wait for it to be signed by the governor. So as it passed in the houses, it increases the multipliers. For pre-K, it increased from 1.15 to 1.2. For K through 12, for a student that is spending over 80% of their time in a general ed setting, it has increased from 1.0075 to 1.12. For K-12 students that are spending less than 80% of their time in a general ed setting, it has increased point, from 0 0.995 to 1.06. So we will take any increase. It wasn't exactly what we were hoping for back in January, but it's a step in the correct direction. The bill also increases the cap from 13.5% to 15%. So for a district that has more than 13.5% of their population receiving special ed services, this is great news because the state will now pay up to that 15% cap. There's also a safety net award change um, if the student's IEP costs exceed 2.2 times the average per pupil expenditure for a school district of our size. Um, so it's a step in the right direction. There's always next year. No. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so free school meals, uh, the House Bill 1238, which uh, was aimed to prevent, provide free school meals for all, was signed by the Speaker April 18th, President of the Senate the 19th, and now we wait for the governor's signature. That will be a common thread in some of these. So as it passed, it is a phased in. Uh, process. So for next school year, for 2023-2024, schools that have 40% or more of their students eligible for free or reduced meals, they will offer free school meals to the entire school. In 2024-2025 school year, that will change down to 30%. And then beginning in 2024-2025, school districts must implement a breakfast program in each school that is also required to provide school meals. Um, and I believe our schools are already providing breakfast, so that doesn't necessarily apply to us, but it is an important part of the bill. Um, just one of this, um, with that bill, it's those schools that's only K-4. Oh, so okay. it's so, I mean, or well, so it includes all, any, so it, it's, yeah. So it's our elementary, it brackets our elementary school, mm -hmm. but it would not, that does not apply to our secondary school. So at least um, it's a small step forward. Mm -hmm. Again, a common thread, a step forward, not exactly where we were headed. Um, the transportation bill to provide adequate and predictable student transportation died in the Senate Rules Committee. The Purple Star Award, which creates a, um, and it establishes a Purple Star designation to recognize school districts that demonstrate educational and social emotional supports to students of military service members, was signed by the Speaker on the 14th, the President of the Senate on the 17th, and now we wait for the Governor. And then the transitional kindergarten bill that we were following um, has taken so many turns. Um, that I'm going to specifically tell Denise that step in when, if, if I err. So um, it, it just changed so many times. So House Bill 1550, which would provide transitional kindergarten, um, was it did pass. Yeah. How, yeah. So well. So feel free to interject. So so as it passed. Um, there is some child eligibility, which we were worried initially about what the child eligibility would, would be because Central Kids Out is currently providing a fantastic transition to kindergarten program. And one of 
our worries at the beginning was that this bill would tear apart the program that is very successful in our district and is showing great returns. So that the eligibility in the bill, the children are eligible for the transition to kindergarten program if they turn five years old between September 1st of the year of admission to transition to kindergarten um, between September 1st and following August 31st. Um, they do not have access to enroll in a federal or state program providing high quality early learning services. They do not have access to or have been referred by a licensed early learning program provider. And three are either on the wait list for, but not scheduled for enrollment in an ECAP or individually determined through a screening process or other instruments to have a developmental delay. I wanted to be very specific. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can send it to the legislature. Yeah. So many amendments. So I'm going to let Denise take over. So, so the good news for this year is um, with how it passed, um, our Jumpstart K program should be good for next year. <laughs> um, there is a lot of debate over this. The House and the Senate did not agree on this bill. And so um, there's a lot of work. It's going to come up again next year. Yeah. Um, Chair Santos over the House Education Committee is not happy with where it landed at all. And so um, it's going to come up next year. So we have a lot of work to do in the interim, uh, meeting with our legislators to try to, you know, maybe showing our Jumpstart K program and, and you know, it's making sure the legislature wants to, they, they by law, they're supposed to have it in, you know, in statute, and and I and I get that, and also what some of the proposals from this, it's going to hurt students, and so we've got to figure out how, like, yes, they can put it in statute and not harm students. So, um, and I, I just want to say, I want to thank my friends and they, um, like Tracy and Megan because they're that push for us. Uh, we let our legislators know, and I heard that when I came to meet, like. We heard from the district again. And so I was like, I was like, really? What? And then once y'all told me what uh, we, we pushed back heavy on it. I think to give you really a glance at how important this is, uh, this is that that little gap. I mean, I come from the head start world where you know it's the lower income, but we have that little gap of people that work that are making it too much over that this affects, especially yeah, my, my, half of my day, exactly. And I think that that's why this was so important. And then when uh, Dr. Princeton and the rest of the board had said, hey, this affects us in our district, our legislators reacted. And I thank you all for uh, stepping up and do that. I can say I did, but I thank you for speaking about that because it, it affected the way that they looked at it and said, okay, this, we didn't know that in that context, even though we had told them this. But <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. So, yeah. yeah, and that's something we do want to look at going into next year yeah. when this, I, I do believe this will, come up every year um, until they really have it hammered out. So one, you know, a couple of things that we want, do want to look at going into future years are, is that eligibility? Like, is the eligibility as proposed in the legislature too narrow? Is it missing a group that we are currently serving in our community that do not have options elsewhere? And then also, you know, has the legislature figured out a funding source? Because, you know, Historically, it was um, general ed funding that was being used for this, and so one of the one of the proposals, I mean, the initial proposal had no actual funding. It was going to be grant based, yeah, grant based, but they weren't sure where the grants were going to come from. So, if they're going to restrict our program through very narrow eligibility and also do not have the funding to carry through the program, all they've done is kill the program. Um, so that, you know, that's going to be something that I am looking at going into next year. And if you guys want to follow along next year, that'd be great too. Uh, all right, that's all I got. No, like just, um, good, yes, good job. Correct. And I think it's, it's a year round cycle. So it's now it's we're in term and, and working on that, you know, building those relationships with our legislators. Or continuing to build relationships with them. Sure. Thank you so much. Seriously, well, well uh, informed with great information. All right. Uh, 
Next, we are being asked to approve resolution 1422-23, delegating authority to the Washington State Intersyntactic Activities Association. All right, I think I think you just summed it up, Adrian. It's something we do every year. So we'll bring this to you every spring, and it does it delegates authority to WIA. Uh, are there any comments, questions from the board? We have a motion to approve resolution number 1422-23, delegating authority to the Washington Intersyntactic Activities Association. Move to approve resolution 1422-23, designating authority to the Washington Intersyntactic Association yeah. 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 All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Intergalactic Activity Association is approved as presented. All right. Now we have the first reading. Uh, we are being asked for the first reading of revision to policy 3141, non resident status. Ms. Monroe. All right. Thank you. Um, what we're bringing here is a long standing policy and just a minor update. The, the minor update or edit is around providing families an opportunity to appeal denial with the Office of Teaching and Learning before having to go to the school board for an appeal. So that, that's the one edit you'll see in your board packet and bringing it tonight for first reading. All right, this is the first reading. So do we have any questions or comments from the board? We have a motion to approve the first reading of revised policy 3141, non-resident status as presented. Move approval of first reading of revisions to policy 3141, non-resident status as presented. You have a second. Second. All right, all those in favor, please do by by saying aye. 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 All right, we're unanimous. Uh, the first reading of revised policy 3141, non resident status, has been approved as presented. Next is the budget status report for April 2023. Ms. Bell. Sorry, making sure my alarms don't go off. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Uh, in your sorry, in your board packet, uh, you have the monthly budget status report as of March uh, 2023. So during the month of March, uh, our general fund uh, ended at uh, 15 about 15.5 to 15.6 million dollars. Uh, this is right in that mid range that we've been seeing the last few years. Um, this this uh, includes um, you know, revenues up to date plus all of the adjustments with our um, apportionment, you know, with uh, with regular apportionment plus all the uh, transportation because the transportation funding came in. So, so everything is is current and up to date as of that point. Um, in our general fund, as you as you're looking through those reports, um, I have adjusted the revenues based upon the updated amount. What I have not adjusted are expenditures. Um, you know, we've been talking with the board about um, reduced spending for this year as well as uh, you know planning for next year. So at this point, while the revenues are updated, the expenditures are not. So um, in the next report, as of April, I will be making those adjustments based upon the conversations that we've had um, in the leadership team, but we've also shared with you. Um, as of um, as of March, our revenues um, are tracking as as we would expect it. Expenditures year to date um, are are right on track, and and we do know that those those will adjust moving forward uh, based upon the the uh, budget reductions or the spending reductions that we're making. And then um, our projected ending fund balance is. Um, Currently at 12.7, but that will go up as I make those uh, adjustments to spend. Any question about the general fund? Any questions, questions for the board? Okay. Uh, debt service ASB and transportation vehicle are uh, tracking as uh, anticipated. Uh, we're starting to see an uptick in um, debt service uh, revenues uh, and fund balance. Um, we'll see a big uh, bump up in April with the spring tax collections, 
And then on June 1st is our next bond um, interest payment. So we'll, we'll see that go back down. And then capital projects, um, we're still uh, tracking our, uh, our revenues are right where we expect them to be, but expenditures um, are, are significantly lower due to the delays that we've been seeing, as well as uh, fund balance being up because we just haven't been spending money. But that that is starting to take a turn and uh, we'll hear a lot more about those projects um, after after I go sit down. <laughs> Any questions about the budget status report? Ready to move on to enrollment? Good. Yes. Yeah. I really don't want to talk about enrollment. Yeah. <laughs> um, skip a toe. I know, I don't really, yeah. Um, enrollment as of April, uh, April 10th was the first day of the uh, school day of the month. So um, we did see some significant decreases in our enrollment. Um, overall, in grades K through 12, we lost um, 108 student MPE between March and April. Um, many of those were good losses. I mean, kids graduated, they met their credit requirements and they're, they're gone um, because they, they, we've, we've got them over the finish line. So, you know, it's not a terrible thing, but it's, it's, it's not in the numbers. The other um, big factor in the enrollment decrease, and, and we really see this um, highlighted at the elementary level, is the, um, the departure of the carrier that was at uh, PSNS uh, in, in Omaha. So um, once that, that ship um, went back to San Diego, a lot of those families left us too. So uh, you can see that uh, at elementary school, our primarily um, military serving building, we saw decreases in those areas. Uh, and then we also saw uh, those um, you know, smaller decreases at the middle school. Um, so any questions? So, and just the, the, for context for this, I don't go back and forth with these things because I like feel what's the vacation, but on a national level, this, this is happening on a national level. And uh, with, with, with a research team that is looking at this as an objective of like what, you know, what's going on. And, you know, those those things are uh, what they're diving into now. So, um, from what I said, we will have in February some good data on where people have went. And a lot of it, uh, or one data that I think was very interesting was the gentrification of a lot of communities that uh, throughout the United States that people moved and it was like four miles away. So I think that we're going to we're going to see a lot of data uh, pertaining to that, which I keep echoing here. That's one record keep saying about all those key population we say, but but I think thank you to to know that you know we're, we're looking at it and that that speaks to what what we lost. We, we at least know these these uh, places where they are. Yeah. Um, and, and one thing I did want to point out, you know, we've seen over the last two months some pretty significant enrollment declines, um, much greater than what I would have anticipated. Mm -hmm. Because of this, um, I have gone through and adjusted um, my thinking around enrollment projections for next year. Um, I don't think that, um, you know, given this new information, Moving forward with the with the assumptions that I had previously really were the um, the, the best uh, the most prudent path um, moving forward. So I, I have gone through and made those adjustments. So when we start talking very specifically and diving into budget, um, it, we're gonna we're gonna be looking at lower enrollment numbers than than what we had talked about previously. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Or are we seeing similar numbers in other districts in the town of Um, We were seeing, uh, when when I talked to my peers at other districts, um, at, you know, earlier in the year, we were seeing very similar numbers of, you know, decreases from, from the prior year. I have not checked in with my colleagues this spring to see if they're seeing these, these big drops. Um, but I can, I will certainly do that. We've got a, we've got a business managers meeting actually this Friday. So that is, that is a topic that I can uh, bring up and, and find out what other districts are seeing this spring. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right. Is she alive? No, she's not alive. Hey. Perfect. Good. Thank you. All right, um, here. Exactly. All right, our next item is business replacement update. This is not a fair question to ask, but you know. So, thanks for having us tonight. We want to go over a few of the things tonight. We want to talk about the project budget. Um, so, we're going to talk about current budget, some notes on that, and then I go through the site plan side activity, thought you would enjoy seeing some progress photos and uh, just other things that are going on the site. I uh, want to talk about future planning at Fairview and then talk about budget, budget, budget options. So, um, next, next please, 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 please. Oh, thank you. Um, so I want to do a little quick uh, background and history on this. When this project, Fairview Metal School, as you know, it's not done with voter free bond. It was taking advantage of SCAP funding from RSPI, as well as heavy, federal heavy impact on our funds. When we first envisioned this project, we had a budget of about $65 million, And that's where we kind of did our modeling initially against. And so then we came in last June and preset by five million and that so that was a budget ad at that time based upon what we had learned uh, based upon the fact that we changed the sites from uh olympic high school for fairview to remain at fairview instead and um then we came back in september because of the challenges we were having with permits and anticipation our permits were going to be late and in that we didn't ask for a budget reset at that time but we asked for a budget status or we gave you a budget status of where we projected it might be at that time, which was 72.4 million. Now that as, as is asterisk, uh, it indicates that didn't include all the schedule impacts related to permit issuance. And we knew we were burning cash there month by month. So in October, we brought in a memo because we needed to for our OFPI funding eligibility to remain on course for release this July in a couple of months here in 2023. We brought forth that memo and at that time, we said, we're gonna have to have a funding increase. We're gonna come back to you when we know more with your more, um, more actual costs on the permit with uh, a range we expect of a budget that will add they were from 1.5 to 5 foot million, five million dollars. So total top out at 71.5 to 75 million. Next, please. So just some project budget notes here as a reminder. You've seen this most of the slide before. Um, we've had subcontractor cost increase due to material and labor increases, all kind of still reacting to COVID. Um, so this so that really did impact the buyout, all of which occurred in bidding last year and some of which was committed finally committed to contract early this year of course we've had the permit delay impacts we we had planned to start the work on september 7th of last year we had reset it for some of our forecasting purposes to january 3rd we actually got started in the field on, in, on january 27th that's when we got our site development activity permit our building permit actually didn't arrive to us until uh March 10th, and so they thought, and thought it was early March. So, um, so it was a little later, but we were still able to start on the site, and the building permit we anticipated would trail some, but but of course not uh, as much as it had. So just mentally, each of those permits took about 11 months to get, which is uh, quite a difference than we've ever seen before. Uh, so then we look at the budget strategies implemented, and uh, this, as you know, we've used the progressive design development model. And while I think it, you know, doesn't represent what I would call savings in cost per se, I think it does manage cost well, because we'll talk more later on in this presentation about construction contingency, because we've done a lot to vet a lot of things out and resolve them in advance. And that's because we have both the contractor and designer on board with us through the process. Um, so uh, the Bagheri team maximum price amendment five is finalized. Um, it's uh, coming to Aaron to sign tomorrow, finally. Uh, we've gotten through all the all the language um, corrections we wanted to see in there and all the requirements we wanted. So we're, we're happy with that outcome. That's a big milestone. 
um, it does incorporate um, known costs for permit delay. And by that, I mean known costs as of now. Uh, we have also imported and included some overtime to the contractor in the early going to meet the schedule we want to. We've spent a lot of time looking at the schedule. Originally, we had hoped to occupy at a milestone of the school year, whether that's in the summer, whether it's a spring break, whether it's at Christmas. We are now aiming for a spring break the next year. We are, our substantial completion date is, I think, on this Amendment 5 at March 29th. In order to achieve that, though, we had to lay down and pay some overtime costs. And we may have to pay more going forward uh, to achieve that because it's tight. And, you know, we appreciate that Skanska has brought forth a lot of uh, suggestions in, in their own self-reformed work that they can control the schedule earlier on and the, and the concrete and the structural steel and those foundational areas that, that really don't then uh, compound themselves as they go through a process that they get behind because they want to keep their, their subcontractors all coming behind them on task and on time. Um, the last piece here is review updates of budget, of budget components. Um, we, as you'll see tonight, the options have gone through reducing construction contingency below a percentage that we normally would have, but we feel comfortable with the range we're providing to you to, to think about. And uh, we have looked at other owner costs. Uh, we certainly dialed in all of our consultant costs. We've looked at administrative costs uh, for the school of staffing, and uh, we, we had looked at possibly reducing that some, but decided against it uh, because of the confined site and wanting uh, the uh, administrators to have time to focus on what they need to in the building. Uh, we also have a full-time security uh, representative there, which is helping, of course. Um, and then we uh, looked at other incorporation of further project alternates. Um, as you have heard me say before, we try to um, never answer a question fully until we absolutely have to. And by that, I mean, we try to keep anything on the list that we hope to buy on the list until we can't have to say no. And so we're always uh, thinking about ideas uh, that we can incorporate that have been presented to us as priority. So um, that's kind of what we see and, and what we've incorporated in these budget options tonight. Next slide, please. So this is the site plan. Um, on this plan, up is north, uh, right at the Central Valley Road where you enter. And of course, the, the south of the site is, is at the bottom and the fields are to the west. And so a little hard to see these uh, 3D rendering, uh, but then you can see the front entry of the school in the top right uh, of rendering and the arrow pointing to where the front entry will be. And I will say that currently, if you see about where the boarding parking and student drop off is, that's a, a rough where the front of the building almost is now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're dropping that building component quite a bit south and therefore allowing that separated um, parking, student drop off and, and the bus drop off areas. And it gives a more gracious entry, uh, more of an approach entry. You can see the building as you come onto it better instead of it just suddenly being there and be wondering where you're gonna park at the same time. Um, the other uh, rendering, is the Commons Courtyard area, and the arrows pointing to that, and that's on the west side. Uh, you'll recall that's on a lower level, and it looks up toward the fields, and there's you know still trees, and you know you need to, to look at and enjoy by being out in that space. And you see a lot of glass in in the front entry area, as well as that courtyard area from the Commons, and there's nice glass. Can't totally see it, but up in the very top corner of the top photo, you see some glass where the the sign kind of heads up. That's actually the library area. So a lot of a lot of nice, nice a lot of nice glass incorporated in the building that well, I think will make a huge difference. Uh, these classrooms, as they exist, are are not, not very well lit by the natural light or window openings. So it'll be a huge difference. Um, so I, one other thing I want to point out on here, which we'll be talking about in a moment is uh, along that line uh, that's, you know, kind of where you see existing cracked fields off to the right, so all the building and site development, and then it's kind of blank on the fields, cracked fields. So that area is one of those areas that we're gonna talk about that's not in scope currently. Um, hasn't been really all along, hasn't been an affordable model to incorporate that all along. 
very desirable to do. And uh, certainly we've heard that from the staff and we know that to be true. We've heard it from our maintenance folks too, you know, the field conditions are soggy. And so, you know, we want that to be better. So I just wanted to show you kind of where that line was. Um, and then of course, down at the very bottom, we're, we're also going to talk to some tonight about the modernized gym that we do the proposed for our area. Next, please. So this is a proposal for you. Uh, we tried to drop in the uh, lead mining site plan at the top so you could see where these photos were taken from. So essentially, this was taken from the field area looking up the hill toward the new building. Next, please. And this one is looking, if you were at the front entry of the, the school, kind of back from it, you could see the difference um, in the elevations from what will be the slab on grade of the main building and what will be the lower area uh, for the um, lower four classrooms and the courtyard um, for the commons. Next, please. This is a retaining wall. See where the arrow is there? So this basically, um, where the uh, backhoe sitting up on top of it is the fire lane mm -hmm. and it's contiguous to the uh, common courtyard and then it will drop down to the stormwater uh, retention facility and the fields below. Next, please. This is just a foundation reinforcing steel and film work. We, we engineers love these. Um, <laughs> they're, so, they're so linear, so structural looking and, and it, it's exciting just to see it going in and, and you forget what goes underground, but it's kind of a nice visual. Uh, this is looking again from the south to the north uh, toward the existing uh, building now, which will be demolished. Next please. And then here is a, uh, this was taken 421, so last week. Uh, this is the retaining wall progress. This is where the separation of the slab on grade will go in the foreground for the main part of the building, and then the retaining wall will support, you know, what drops down in the commons and the lower floors. Next, please. And this last one is just showing in the locker room or weight area. This was a request of the school. They, they have an abundance of locker room areas at the school, but not a, as much utility in terms of uh, fitness and, and weight room and being able to supervise by PE teachers having two uh, groups of kiddos going on at one time. So this uh, is demolishing those areas. Uh, we're also putting back in uh, or keeping an opening in this area where we, they have good visibility going uh, between these spaces. Next, please. Okay, so this gets into the future planning of the fair queue and what is currently not in the project budget uh, for the options presented tonight. So these are potentially future capital levy and or funding available after the Fairview Middle School project is completed. So as an example, on the interior, uh, and these are big rocks. I mean, these aren't necessarily some very minor things that may be able to be accommodated more easily. Uh, we are not replacing the gym bleachers this time, and we're not replacing the gym floor. The gym floor is actually not in bad shape, really. It's not been installed that many years ago. Uh, the bleachers, they, uh, if they were replaced, it would be a refresh, really, uh, of the bleachers. These are operational. Are they great? No, but they are operational. Uh, we put the bleachers back generally in the same location, but um, we recently replaced and only some bleachers that were refreshed to have some operational issues. So just for order of magnitude, that's probably a $300 to $500,000 item, give or take. Um, if you were to do that, and look at in the future, it would be a good opportunity to do the flooring or consider doing the flooring at the same time. Um, gym scoreboard, medium board, I mean, we, they have a functional gym scoreboard now. If it uh, is modern or current or as might be preferred, no. But, but we have essentially created the pathway for one to go in in the future. So, you know, these, these are items that could be done as fairly standalone pieces if, if and when money became available or as a package. But, but they're just some things that we uh, have not included. Um, on the exterior, again, as I mentioned earlier, we haven't included anything for field. So if right now the main soccer football field is a grass field, it was converted to turf field. Uh, we have a synthetic rubber track, which was replaced within the last eight years. Um, you know, we may want to lean into that. Uh, we also, would, if we did that, would want to put in the main field track uh, and pathway lighting for use of the field in uh, darker hours. We did contemplate that and it is permitted as part of the conditional use permit to achieve that. So just FYI on that point. 
And then the last thing is just the drainage of the grass field. So where the drainage before, uh, you know, we have put in underfill drainage like on a Campagnos, for example, I think that is very effective. Um, so those are things that are not in there now. And I would expect this bottom part of the list, just, you know, a bit of a wag, but it, it's probably easily a $3 million plus dollar uh, project to do that. Um, so those are just things to be aware of as we go forward. But again, they're not in built now. So we wanted that to be clear, no, no uncertainty about that. Next, please. So with budget option one, this is what I call uh, the high water mark uh, uh, option. Uh, this requests going to the bottom an increase of $3.8 million. This is based upon uh, a reduction of our construction contingency I mentioned earlier. That's currently at 6% to 5%. Uh, it maintains all the costs in the budget that are expended uh, for the fair view replace, uh, replacement at only costs. So those were some lost some costs there when we when we moved it back to fair view. And it does maintain the procurement amount for furniture and fixture equipment. And um, potential cost in this one, as I mentioned, uh, our cost for additional overtime to achieve the schedule. We definitely want to make that March 29 substantial completion because um, particularly our technology, our entire staff uh, impacted by that um, uh, move over really needs that week to move over. <laughs> So, um, and you know, it was done it that way in the uh, Middle School, worked well. Um, you know, it takes some uh, orchestrating to be sure, but it's very doable and, um, you know, it did work well. Um, you know, we went through any further contingency costs. Um, and on that point, I, I, you know, made some notes about just in talking about construction contingency, what we can face. Um, you know, a lot of it's surrounding the schedule for sure, is if we have to add some overtime there. But we still could run into some, some things um, related to demolition. Uh, we could have a rainfall uh, and be impacted by days. We wouldn't give any money for those days, but we don't want them to not use those days because we're trying to make that substantial completion schedule. Um, you know, things of that nature could hit us. It's actually been, we've been pretty successful on the ground so far. Uh, we've had a few things come up, but, but not much cost uh, compared to a lot of places. I mean, we had significantly more underground um, unforeseen conditions and impacts, like the Pekin High School or at um, Jackson Park Elementary School. I mean, so, so we've seen we've seen some underground site costs before. Knock on wood, so far we haven't seen those in the same way here. And so I mentioned that because that's a big risk area, right? Big risk for construction contingency. So uh, we've been fortunate there so far. So. By leaving all these things essentially in here, these are the uh, highlights of it. Uh, we arrive at a project budget option of 73.8 million and adding 3.8 million dollars. Um, next slide, please. Option two is the low water mark, if you will. Um, this reduces construction contingency to 4%. Uh, we have done some research on what most owners or contractors recommend a construction contingency amount for aggressive design build, and they recommend between three and five percent. So, you know, we don't want to go too late, but um, it's possible. And um, as I just said, you know, I think a lot of the, the risk um, team at this point is manageable, but we don't want to go too late. So, uh, this would a transfer the cost expended for Fairview replacement only million dollars to another uh, category. It's kind of a accounting exercise because it's, we still pay the money. So yeah, it doesn't show up in this budget, but it showed up in another budget. Um, so it doesn't really solve anything. Uh, we also uh, shown here reducement of FF and E cost by, um, by about 11% or $330,000. So considerations here, you know, we may have to come back on this one. Um, you know, wouldn't really expect to, but it's a higher potential for it. I'll put it that way. Um, and it, you know, would for some of the, the furniture fixture equipment since we'll further costs are getting down. Uh, we may also have have enough budget in there that we'll be able to achieve what we need to even without it. But we're still getting parts again on all of our procurement at this point. So this project budget option seventy one eight ninety, adding an amount of funding of one point eight nine dollars. Next slide, please. So third option is kind of the middle of the road. Uh, here we've gone back up to 
potential for construction contingency. We've cut the cost for uh, Love Club from Old Lady Campus to Fairview in the budget. And we had a, a, a smaller reduction of that that week, uh, just $120,000. Again, this is kind of uh, same considerations, but has less higher potential than option two did. This project budget option is at 73390 and uh, the increase amount is 3.39. Next slide, please. So this is the summary page. Uh, again, we had projected in October, we're probably gonna be at 71, five to five. These three budgets range within that um, rent injury that we predicted. And we wanted to give the opportunity tonight for the board to, to talk about this and consider what they are comfortable doing. And then for subsequent to this, we will populate the number into the recommendation of a modernization for the budget as well as for the uh, furniture picture and equipment demo. And then we'll also, we brought to you a uh, change order three, which basically incorporates um, pretty much fully everything on the music and gym that had been asked for. So, um, so and that's the, you know, part of the construction that they've seen recently. So. But it, um, one question I just want to make sure is included in the presentation for the public then. And we all of this is within the inflation and we have put in with uh, materials that we've done the work. We see how the economy is going as far as that's projected in the budget. Yes, so, yeah. yes it is. Yeah, I mean, I think the construction contingency is in a good place right. in general, I do. Um, also something to keep in mind, the contractor has built into the GMP, this is just part of the procurement methodology that's accepted everywhere. They have what's called a risk contingency. And they, um, so if they miss something, instead of coming to us and arguing that, uh, they have to get our approval on it, mind you, but instead of coming to us and saying, this really needs to, you know, we need to have a change order for this, a lot of things can be resolved inbound of that guaranteed maximum price within that risk contingency bracket. Yeah, well, let's make sure we understand this is what we asked um, them to do, to bring us back, what the different budgets would look like, and forecast ahead um, for this, but we we'll keep that in mind to our request and they have come back and uh, gave us this request uh, forward. Um, and then I also will say this, that, you know, I know that that was, we weren't interested in doing a great, uh, yeah, you were not interested in it, <laughs> but I know you wanted it, but what was it, right? So the, the, the main thing too is that we know what their needs and we know what opportunities to um, there. Uh, for that school, and I think that you know, making a decision that best fits what the economy looks like, so you know we can go forward without the, the stoppage. But I, but I want to uh, make sure that is understood with the community. A lot of this, and we heard this throughout the county, was a delayed municipality not having enough staffing, and you know we saw that throughout different governments that were going over the same thing. And I think we did a good job of uh, making sure that hey, we stayed in the things that they, we had to get done. It's costing you know us a lot, so. Um, Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I definitely know. So I wanted the community to know that this was, you know, an effort on everybody's end to make sure that those conversations were happening with the county to say we got to get this done. So um, with that said, any other questions or comments from the board? All right. Sure. Um, they can yes, it's like we need to have a discussion. I mean, we can't we can't just say we're going to vote. Like we need to have a discussion of. Uh, <laughs> and I so I think just um I know when I was looking at these before the meeting um you know we at our at our last site visit we gave a head nod on our new vision mission for values and goals and so I wanted to know like and the point of having those is that when we have tough decisions that's what's guiding us and so just. I know, like I'm looking like, okay, like if our vision is a vibrant, inclusive learning community, you know, like, it, is it worth it then that we, we have a, a bigger budget so that those furnishing pictures and equipment, you know, that we can give our students everything they want. But then at the cost of, you know, if we're using that money for the capital project now, that potentially, you know, it's, it's kind of like we're pushing other projects so much further down the road for other students, right? So, or in that, I don't know if I'm, if I'm right in that assumption. You know, I think, and then Paula can weigh in here uh, too, if I don't answer this, you know, totally with all accuracy, but I, you know, we still are, are maintaining uh, the board balance that the board wants right. to, what, you know, on the $10 million. There's still some other uh, untapped money to uh, 
time analysis that, that we have utilized. We, we are funded on all of our other projects from going forward, but uh, for right now, we paused until we don't send a second floor. Um, okay. You know, that was not an uh, We also are not in a position at this point to do uh, before with early development and learning, um, but it isn't like anybody's fault or really there's anything that isn't, isn't I, perhaps not ideal, but, but not like really meeting the funds right away. We also hope that, you know, with the small stage of heavy impact, that, 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 that balance will come up more. Um, and I also hope, and, and I do believe, but it may not be a ton of money, but I do believe uh, we're comfortable with all these special options. And, and I believe that we will have some money to put toward the line of those fields. And with potentially the heavy impact funds that will be coming, that can proceed forward because it, you know, probably won't have a, a we're not envisioning a levy uh, in the immediate future or a bond. So um, that, I feel like we're, we've, uh, we've wrapped it in well uh, for not pushing things off or not uh, and if we were, if we did have any of those things, we'd be telling them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's so no problem. You can tell by these three. I mean, Robin and her team, they've done a tremendous amount of work because these three amounts are very, very close. Yes, they are. Um, I mean, there's not a lot of work to do. Even when you look at option two, a million dollars of that is just, it, it's a, like, as she said, it's just moving it to another registry. These are, these are really, really close. Um, what option one gives us that option two doesn't give us is that additional budgetary capacity to be able to um, respond to needs or if, if there are additional savings or, uh, um, if, or if we find out this spring or this summer that we qualify for heavy impact, the ability to maybe start picking off on some of those smaller things that aren't in the scope of this. So, you know, that, I, you know, if Robin says the, the contingencies and the FF&E are, are, you know, are good, I, I trust her. But if we have that additional capacity and dollars coming from another source or, or um, you know, something happens and we need to put ad additional dollars in order to be able to meet the timelines, then, then that flexibility is there. Yeah, and I do appreciate, Grace, you know, one of, you know, option number one, having the flexibility if we do need to increase the overtime to make that move in phase. Um, so I, I, I do appreciate the flexibility that option one would give us, uh, using that as just one example. And, I, and I'll, I'll add this, we don't, we don't know what the economy is going to do. And that's where, for me, it's, it's, it's such a, you know, a, a real thing of let's, let's put it out. We know one or two things. It happened to us with this project. So I was thinking that there was money that came down. And the next thing you know, we go, oh, thank you. It's a little bit more comfortable. So I think that having that, I think the team here does a good enough job that if we know that extra money came through, if every of that does hit, or we find money, which we, we have been great with that with our facility, but I think the overall thing is giving our community exactly what it needed. We look at all of our facilities, um, you know, maybe little things here and there could have been better, but we learned from that. And giving kids what they deserve to have everything that we said that they need to have for them. And I think us not knowing how the economy is going to be is very uncertain. I think to give this team that ability to say, hey, go ahead, take this and do what you need to do, just report back to us sooner than later if anything that changes or anything that has come through. So any other comments or questions? One other thing I might add um, too is that we have asked the contractor really what kind of shape they're in in terms of procurement. You know, right. is there something you're not telling us? They've said no. You know, they have they've got a lot of this stuff out already bought out. In fact, just next Monday, uh, air handling units are coming in and they're gonna be stored over at our uh, maintenance yard. Uh, because there's going to be a very second site, and you know, and that's behind the security area. But but that's a good example. I mean, how we got out in front of the whole of that element because that's one of the worst laundry items, and they're feeling very confident about where the, the buyout is. You know, all the work they've done on the uh, subcontractor bidding, 
and procurement of materials. So, you know, we're not hearing, there, there was their biggest concern right now is meeting that schedule. They know it's tight. And so, you know, they're working hard to do that. And, uh, you know, they got their hands full to get it there. But I, uh, but that seems to be the, the only real concern that we're hearing. And I, and I just would look say, we have to be really, really low in there. We don't know where we're going to be for next year or two. Let's just uh, forward doing our best uh, to maintain and look around that curve. We still have to be diligent that we may not have. I don't want to be in that position where we could be looking at, but we have to slow it down and stop it. Uh, you know, so I just want to put that out to you. Even if I get there, you know, budget, even though she's giving it. So that, I mean, it's my understanding here is that if you're deciding whether you want to spend 73A or whether it's the money that we have, but okay. right. yeah. what it comes down yeah. to is what we have left over. Well, it's it's about about the yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, these are the three options, and what we're going to do is make a, a based on the options. We have a motion to approve the Fairfield Middle School replacement budget modification, and there's one or two ways you can do it. Yeah, that's a two or two. Yeah, I think a good way to do it is really just do a voice. A voice. What's that again? A voice. Uh, split voice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So, and who's doing this? We got Tally. All right. So, um, for project budget, budget option one, Director Tracy. Yes. Yes. Director Hara. Yes. Director Green. Yes. Right. I Hey, thank you. Hey, sorry. All right. All right. All right. All right. For option two, oh, Jackson, sorry. Uh, Jackson, yes. All right. No, no, budget. Yeah, make sure that we want to go through it. We want both. We just say somebody. All right. So, so we'll then motion. Yeah. Put that in mind. Budget increase, budget increase, right? Yeah, but it's a modification, right? All right. So, do we have a motion to approve the Fairfield Middle School replacement budget modification to seventy-three million eight hundred thousand as presented? Oh, three point eight million. Sorry, three point eight million as presented. Move yeah. so, approval of the Fairview Middle School replacement budget of occupation to three million dollars as presented. Correct. We have a second. Second. All right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All right. With unanimous vote. Uh, the Fairfield Middle School replacement budget modification has been approved to three point eight million as presented. Yeah, this is just it's just that that modification. So, and thank you all for the board. All right, next we are being asked to approve the request for the delegation of authorization to the change order three to arrangement with the Skanska USA Building Inc. for the Fairview Middle School replacement project. Yes, and so this this one is asking for delegated authority five hundred thousand dollars. That five hundred thousand dollars is inbound of that construction contingency that you just voted on. So it's not an added cost. Um, we wanted to we wanted to bring it to your attention. Uh, well, a because Gas was so kind of working on this budget. A couple of the numbers as we went to press, and so right now the number is falling below that. But we wanted to give it a little capacity just so that we wouldn't have to go back, and we will be reporting it actual amounts in a future change so it will show up and be recorded for actual um, accuracy. Um, but one of the reasons we wanted to bring it was because that it does include uh, one of the areas that, that we had um, had saved 
go toward the end to Joy Incorporated, and that is the, the uh, further modernization of the gym and music building. Where the way we had uh, navigated this design process was to get the new building fully designed, get the site work fully done, doing what we what we really thought we had to take on the structural and envelope areas of the music gym building. And in that though, if we went through it in time, so left um, modernization yet to complete in the music and gym areas. We we had some good dialogue with the team there and uh, have understood their needs. We have this change order incorporates the primary part of that interior improvement that, that had been requested. Um, there are a couple of things we're probably still working through of a very minor nature, but I mean, I'm talking very minor nature. Um, it was a good thing about those being the classrooms in particular, they're getting uh, windows, uh, which will be lovely. You know, a, a refresh lighting, I mean, all of the interior stuff. And the choir room, of course, the risers are being removed. Uh, uh, so that's going to make that much more flexible space for them. They would have loved to have had the band rear risers being too, it was a, but that was a decision made very early on. And so it was going to be a very heavy lift. And, you know, it's something they've worked with. Uh, not perfect, perhaps, but, but still a good model um, that they are, they understand. I just think that's the best way of putting that. Um, so this is for that authorization. And um, that's why we're asking you know, that tonight in order to do those two things. Sure. Any questions, comments from the board? We have a motion to approve the delegate authority to change order number three to agreement with Stansted and the city building for the Fairview Middle School Replacement Project as presented. Move approval of delegated authority for change order number three to agreement with Stansted USA Building Inc. for the Fairview Middle School Replacement Project as presented. Second. Second. All those in favor, please do by by saying aye. 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 Delegated authority to change order number three, uh, agreement with Kansas City USA, Inc. Fairview Middle School to replace the project is approved as presented. Then we are being asked to approve the authorization of procurement, uh, furniture fixtures, and equipment for the Fairview Middle School replacement project this year. Yeah. So in this case, because you approved the budget option, increasing the budget amount by 3.8 million, that included a budgetary target of two million nine hundred twenty-five thousand for uh, furniture, fixture, and equipment. And I believe you probably have the board member in front of us that says that without error. <laughs> so just to clarify, <laughs> yes. no, no, no confusion. Numbers are up. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Do we have any questions or comments? So, uh, do we have a motion to approve the authorization of the procurement of furniture? And equipment for every middle school replacement project in the amount of two million nine hundred and twenty five dollars as presented. Thousand, sorry. Uh, thousand. Move approval to, uh, sorry, move to approve authorization for the procurement of furniture, fixtures, and equipment for the Fairview Middle School replacement project in the amount of two million nine hundred twenty five thousand dollars as presented. <laughs> All those in favor, please do reply by saying aye. 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 All right. <laughs> so the procurement of the furniture, fixtures, and equipment for the Fairview School Placement Project has been approved in the amount of two million nine hundred twenty-five thousand as presented. And we thank you for that. I know that uh, Jenny Bryant's here as an example where they're anxious to get some technology ordered. So uh, mm -hmm. not that we were held up from doing it per se, because we had money in there. We just Wanted to make sure that we have this, and then we're ordering some other furniture as well. So we want to make sure we're ready to go at the same time as we the So thank you for that. Um, also, next month we're coming back in to talk about a capital project update of a general nature. You know, Fairview will be one of them, but then some other updates like where Ole is and uh, roofs and pine crest solarization, you know, things of that nature. So we'll be giving an update on that next month. Hopefully, have some photos to show you. And I wanted to uh, certainly thank Joel for all his hard work. He's been terrific on this. And, uh, you know, it's a heavy lift that he can track this contract every time. So uh, he's, he's working entirely for you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, as well, your staff. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been very fortunate. I've had great project managers. Uh, we've done great work. So you're very welcome. Right. Right. Thank you, board. Uh, good, good discussion. It's been well done. <laughs> All right. Um, next, we have.
that communicates with the belt you know, and police that was been and you know with the legislative discussion a lot of this you know all transparency to community and the board a lot of things that uh because we had two great people dealing with legislation and a board that is engaged with the legislation a lot of what uh i was focusing on uh with bill wise had to do with homelessness and uh affordable housing in washington state uh was a good time this is something i've been advocating for for a while and i think we had uh, a lot of good things with the governor that we just had to press and a lot of the foundations that i was dealing with the organizations were really headstrong or let's 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 get it now um and that was where you know, a lot of what i was concentrating on with the budget uh in the state was really that it affects how we get mental children it affects students in our schools so it's not far left from it and every time that my board is where i was supposed to look at mental children and which uh, a lot of people didn't understand the difference of you know well aren't they homeless and they're, yeah but they're students they're homeless students which should not be so um, some good things that came out of it for me. Uh, and I will say, you know, uh, the land was, land was beautiful, man. And, and I was so happy that we had um, a lot of our board here. That was just, it was a great bonding moment for us to get together, to uh, know each other. But then also the information that was there, some of the things that was just so powerful and understanding that we're not unique to, you know, going around in the nation. You know, there's a lot of things that we have to do to better education and to make education stronger. And I'm happy that. I'm in it with my colleagues uh, here. I think that we have a lot of work to do, and we're on that path to do uh, some great work. And came back with uh, just some, a lot of, you know, understanding that education is changing. And I think it's one of the things that we're going to have to really, uh, well, actually, we, a lot of people that have been in this field for a long time are those that are grappling with the change, and those are also embracing the change. Um, you know, Eric, when I first got here, it's like, you know, this was 2019. It's like, hey, technology, you know, we need to be there. And then, boom. So it, it, it's those type of things of seeing where the future is for our children and what does education look like and, and really going there and reinventing what our children, not what we want, but what our children want and need to be successful in this world. So, um, now, besides my son running his first uh, first country track meet, that was kind of like, that's, that's really it for me. And I'm, Hitting school all this week because my son said, "How come she goes to school for the week?" My son called the other, <laughs> so she's. I think she stopped by my son's school. So, so, but so that definitely hit more schools uh, now that uh, legislative session is over and I can see. Okay, great. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so, um, first, um, I want so um, at the end of March. Right before Orlando, um, I met um, on Zoom with Dr. Prince um, and with Kelsey Winter from WASDA. And so, just um, we are doing a WASDA, the WASDA to help us with a full policy review. Um, and so, I think we might have Kelsey come join us at a board meeting to kind of explain more of that process. But I am um, excited for that um, to just to work at getting our policy really tight and, and up to date. Um, and then Director Hine and I were able to um, attend our government to government meeting with the Squamish tribal leaders um, earlier in April. Um, and it was a fantastic meeting. And it was wonderful to see and hear um, what we as a school district, some of our family engagement um, opportunities. Um, and then it was actually, it was on our progress to graduation also, but our graduation rate for our native students is a, is was 100% for the last two mm -hmm. years. So um, that is not, they, so I just think that, I just applaud our students. Um, and then we were able to do um, visits to the PK High School um, and meet with um, some of our native students at PK High School and then with one of our students at Olden. Um, and he was fantastic. Fantastic. And we talked about hope builders a little bit, and it was fantastic to see him as he explained what he wants to do. He's, um, he's a senior this year, he's going to graduate, and he was one of the students on that stage. Um, but studying environmental science, and then he wants to bring what he learned back to the Squamish tribe. And like the. Well, right. Yes. But he, um, it was, who was it? Josh, um, Josh and Leonard from the Squamish tribe, and like their eyes lit up like he was building hope in them with his plans. And so I just, um, I just appreciated that. So um, I did have a couple of 
normal visit, a normal monthly visit to Fairview, and so I parked them in that bottom parking lot, but it's kind of key to see how the instruction is going. And it's exciting to see when I follow the cement truck into the parking lot, and I'm like, okay, there's cement. That's exciting. <laughs> um, and let's see. Um, today, I think we already mentioned, but I did student voice visits up at Ridgetop and at Ole. Um, and that is just it's good to hear from our students. And one thing in particular I enjoyed from the Ole students, a couple of them had mentioned that with students versus having that, um, when teachers provide different options or present the material in different ways. And so they didn't call it, it's that's universal um, design of learning and uh, UDL. And so it was neat to see like that's something we've heard about in our study sessions and we can think of what we that we can teach her that and the positive impact that had on students. So um and then um and then Orlando and NXU was great. And I think like my biggest takeaways um were from multiple sessions were but we as a board um we determine the culture of our school district and as we've looked at that climate data and our um start working by it that okay we as a board um the decisions and the discussions that we have in these board meetings determine that culture. Um, and I also, I love meeting um, other board members from across the country and you hear what's similar, what's working for them, what challenges they're having, um, what's different. And um, one, uh, so just then, sorry, I know, two highlights from a couple of sessions, but I did a pre-conference session um, on how to be, um, how to better um, support our LGBTQ plus students. And I, one of the, the keys from that was that if we don't have strong policies, um, our educators are navigating the process no matter what, whether we have policies or not. And so if we want to support our educators, like we've got to have the discussions and the policies um, at our level or we're just having them navigate in a no man's land. Um, and then, with um with our the meeting of doing a full policy review, I had a great session and it was a school board from back east and they have a 13 member board. So they have three members that are just on a policy committee, but they took a couple of tools, like it was just a Google sheet, but it, um, I have it and, and to look at the, how they were tracking their policies. So they did go from having a lot of policies that were out of date to like now they are reviewing policies, you know, every board meeting um, and they're very much so all those policies that we that we have that are supposed to be reviewed annually, you know, they put on their board calendar. And so just I that was a really kind of like a tool to model um, as we're moving forward. So we're done. Hi. Hi. And sorry for interjecting there. Yeah, I was hired back. He would like to make a speech for us. <laughs> um yeah, so I'm gonna start with um, some brief notes from NSBA. I was shocked at the number of school districts that have that are smaller than us, but they have seven to eleven board members. I mean, just a huge, huge boards for some of these school districts that have six, seven thousand students. Um, so just kind of a, a really brief overview of, of some of the sessions that I sat in on. Um, I sat in on a really great one of, um, about a healthy board and what makes a healthy board versus an unhealthy board. Um, and they, you know, uh, I think his name was Lee, focused on um, having a diverse board. So everyone has input, considers alternative options, compromise is normal, appreciate individual differences as a resource versus a divided board, which really leads to an unsuccessful board because they just can't accomplish things. Where the divided board, you know, allows their personal needs to get ahead of the change, their political influences uh, behind their decisions, allowing philosophical differences to hold up progress. And I, I just thought that that is so important for us as a board to really um, look at whether we are a diverse board and we are looking at. Um, you know, differing opinions of an opportunity to grow or differing opinions of where we're going to hit a roadblock. Um, and then I sat in on a class um, about bias and leadership. Um, considering a, a kind of an overarching theme of this was considering the difference between um, your impact and your intent and that the 
impact is really what's important there. An effective leader uses an equity lens, is committed to being a lifelong learner, engages in inclusive leadership, and has the ability to display empathy and lead with compassion. And there's a Harvard covered bias test that I have not taken yet, but I've talked to Denise about that. Uh, I think might be a really good tool for us um, take as a board and look at um, what our unconscious bias may be as a way to grow as a board. Um, and then I sat in on um, a class about school safety, and it was the superintendents and I believe some of the board members from Santa Fe High School, which unfortunately had a um, school shooting in 2019. I don't remember the um, year and now. But as they were talking about their, um, like, after learning, like, what did we learn from this? What can you take from this so that you are in a better situation? They were all things that we are doing. Um, so it, it actually, I left that class feeling really happy about the fact that we are in CK. They did not have a master key system for their doors. And so they ended up destroying over 80 of their doors when law enforcement had to break into them because they had a key ring with 150 different keys. They did not have a master key available to them. They did not have building maps for law enforcement. Law enforcement had, was not familiar with their schools, and so law enforcement showed up, and they would say, you know, we have an incident in the cafeteria or in this one, and law enforcement had no idea where that was. And I know for a fact that our law enforcement agency, the Kids Out Sheriff's Department, does know our buildings. They are in our buildings regularly. I have, I have been in some of the buildings when law enforcement was there doing just general safety laws. And so I actually left that class as awful as that tragedy, tragedy was for them. I left so thankful that this is the district that we are in and our district has taken these steps. Um, they did not have an established command post. They didn't know where their students should be unified if there was a tragedy. tragedy. So the students and staff scattered they did not know where they were. They, they just ran into the city, ran into the streets. Um, they did not have a process set up with their buses on how to pick up the students and get them to a meeting point. So parents didn't know where their kids were. And the kids had maybe found a friend's house to, you know, run to or pick, you know, hopped in a car. It, it was horrifying, but it made me really appreciative of the groundwork, uh, you know, the the good thank you, the preparation that uh, CK does have. Um, sorry, I have a, I, I'm, this one's not going to be as brief as my legislative report. Um, <laughs> uh, and then another breakout session about communication strategies with the public. And I heard some interesting strategies that I do want to explore more with the board, um, possibly at a retreat or a study session. Um, one of the suggestions was a district PTA council. And what they did was they had PTA officers from the different schools would meet periodically, maybe quarterly. And so they could talk about what, as a PTA officer, what they are seeing in their school, what their PTA is specifically concerned with. Um, and so this PTA council would meet with a portion of the school board periodically. And it could be quarterly or, you know, whatever they decide. I believe that that particular school district met with them um, quarterly. And then they had a superintendent parent group, and they reported that it kind of had mixed results. But I don't think that their plan um, was, you know, well thought out. And it made me, it actually made me uh, really think that it's similar to what we are doing with our ambassador. So we have our, we're in our first year with our ambassador group, and they meet at different locations, and they get a, a tour of the school, and there's presentations by the cabinet members, and the superintendent is there. Um, and so I feel like we're kind of, we're kind of actually doing that. Um, and then something I took away from 
that class is that collaboration is not compliance with an individual or a group's ideology. Collaboration takes a step thinking and problem solving, which takes time. Um, so collaboration is an ever evolving thing and um, it, it does require a little bit of time. And then Dr. Price and I, at the very beginning of NSBA, we had an opportunity to go visit two different schools in Orange County. Um, and I learned so much about the Axolotl. So, <laughs> um, so the first school we went to, their library had ten, maybe 10 aqu uh, aquariums in there. Um, there were baby alligators, which were not my favorite. Um, but I had never seen in person uh, Axolotl. And I did not realize that it is a tiger salamander that has failed to complete metamorphosis. So they had a tank of these salamanders and these axolotls. Yeah, um, they look like a horror nightmare, but it was very interesting. Um, and this school, so the two schools that we went to, they are community schools. So um, it's not something that the community can opt into in the, that first school with all of these very interesting animals. Um, they are absolutely busting at the seams. They have, they do not, it's an eighth grade school and they do not have the footprint to expand. And so one of the ways that they've gotten very creative is they have the funding for the appropriate number of staff per pupil, but they do not have building space. So they have a couple different classrooms where they have two teachers and 40 students all within one classroom. And we visited one. It was very loud, um, but it was very creative as well. And that same school um, has uh, a pretty extensive uh, garden in their, in their yard. And they have partnered with the local farmer's market. So it's like a, it's a full site. So they are learning how to grow and then they are learning how um, to market their produce at the farmer's market. And one of the things that they've done is they have put a QR code on like bags of lettuce or celery. And they are encouraging you after you have purchased this piece of produce, go home and then scan the QR code and share with the school how you use that produce. Like what kind of what kind of recipe did you put it in? How did you use this? And so it's a full it's a full cycle. And then their art their art partner they have an art partnership with a local coffee shop and a record store. So the students art is on the um like coffee sleeves of the coffee shop and then is also on the paper sleeves for the records of the record store. So you can go to the record store and so it's increasing traffic into the coffee shop and you know the local community businesses by the students families because they want to see their artwork in these stores it's pretty cute and then the second the second school we went to in the afternoon is in Eatonville and it is a uh, it was the first self-governing all black municipality in the United States and this school has embraced their community and um, they're, they're really um, carrying on the pride that comes with being that first self-governing municipality. Um, the average income of the community is right around twenty thousand dollars. So it's a um, it was it was uh, quite quite a bit different than the first school we went to because the first school they said that when they built the, when they built the school there, um, the socioeconomic status of that community, um, it wasn't really high, but the school is so good that it drew in a lot of people. Um, so the second school, they are um, really excelling with what they have in the community. They share a property with the Boys and Girls Club, and Boys and Girls Club provides pre, before, after, and school break there. And many of the teachers also work at the Boys and Girls Club, so they are utilizing the Boys and Girls Club as uh, homework help. And so the teachers are there in the afternoon or before school to help all of the students with their homework. And we had hallway presentations by 
um, some pre-K students, kindergarten students, first grade, second grade, and the, the pre-K students, there was a set of boy-girl twins, and I personally have boy-girl twins, so I thought this was funny. And all four of these pre-K students get up and they say, in the 1970s, and then the first student recites a fact, and it's the girl. And then they say, in the 1970s, and now it's supposed to be her brother. So she elbows him, recites his fact for him, and then they continue. <laughs> um, but it was, it was, it was really cute. Um, so that is everything from NSPA. Now, now I'll move on. Um, so yeah, Denise and I were at the middle school jazz festival yesterday. And so it was Fairview CK Middle School, Enumclaw High School. I would yeah. love to know how they ended up here, and then Ridgetop. And so I actually owe Ridgetop a listen later because I had my daughter with me and it was past that time and we needed to get home. Um, but it was fantastic because it was really well attended. There were two food trucks, um, the uh, welfare popcorn and the pies. Thank you. Um, so that was wonderful. The weather was nice. We had three bands out there playing. Uh, I really am. I'm excited to be able to hear more of that. And uh, it was at CK Middle School in their um, little courtyard outside the, the office. Yeah, the office, outside the cafeteria. Thank you. I've been continuing to read with the readers or leaders groups at a couple of the schools. And the third graders I'm reading with are just making leaps and bounds. And I'm so excited to see their progress. And they're moving on to chapter books. So we're working through chapter books. And one, you know, a little bit each week. Um, and so they're starting to finish uh, their first chapter books with me. And then yesterday I was able to be a panelist for some of the AP fours at CK High School. And I was blown away by the creativity that these students had with their project. Um, and you can tell that they have dedicated a full year to this. Um, and I look forward to being able to participate in future years. And then as Denise mentioned, we participated in the Suquamish Tribe Government to Government Day. Um, Sonia Berry and Kaylee Mays did a wonderful job with their presentations to the boards about CK's work, including Indigenous education in our curriculum and extracurricular activities. And then we had a wonderful student-led tour of Olympic High School and CK High School, including um, being able to go into both performing arts centers, which they're both amazing. And I really appreciate that each school, each of our schools has its own little personality. It's like you're meeting a new person. Um, and they're both beautiful and unique in their very own ways. I can't wait to hear. Um yeah, so I was also able to go to the school board conference yesterday very nicely, gave me a spot. Um, and so um, I took the opportunity, they had multiple sessions for new board members. And um, so I got to learn about like what a board member actually does, how, you know, parliamentary procedure, all those kinds of really great um, core things that I really need to know. Um, and one of the other sessions that I went to um, was based on student achievement and how to really look at the data to determine what areas you need to improve in. Um, that's ultimately our goal, right? Is for our students to get achievement so that whatever they do beyond high school, they're going to be successful at it. Um, and so that's that's always kind of in the back of my mind as I'm looking at. Um, some of the data points that we are getting as a board for, you know, ELA and math and science. Um, and another um, session that I went to that also talked about student achievement, um, and it's something that also I would like uh, some sort of a study session or something I could look at, is um, they had, they actually had data on improvements in their student scores on their state tests that they had to do based on the impact of high schoolers. And so one of the things that they do is their high schoolers, um, the week before they graduate, 
they walk through the halls of the elementary schools and they're tapping them down so that the elementary students can see what they're working for. Um, and then another thing that they do is the, the kids for all the grades have a banner for the year that they are going to graduate. And at the end of the school year, they all get together with their banner and they walk down the hall to the next pod for that grade and they get to hang up their banner. So they know this is where I'm gonna be next year. Um, that specific school is smaller than ours. I realize that we have like some elementary schools that like, like I know half, half of them go to Cornelia and half of them end up going to St. Jane School. And so that might be a little bit difficult, but um, they really saw some improvement in their students and their their own um, um, like taking responsibility and ownership in what they were doing because now they could see what they were working for. Um, and so that was that was really great to see kind of some of those things. Um, and I will say that I took the Oxalotl thing, so I had to go on a, a work trip. And um, my husband and I were walking through some shops, and we, of course, run into a kid's shop because you can't go somewhere without your kids and not bring them back with you, right? <laughs> and um, there was an actual oxalotl toy, and so my husband all about this oxalotl and how it came to be and all of that, and he was like, this is so crazy. <laughs> um, and I did get to see an alligator, not <laughs> in the and we were very excited. I was excited. Megan was not thrilled by it, an alligator <laughs> in Florida, but it was next to the swimming pool. <laughs> Um, I thought it was interesting. Um, and then I also really appreciated on a personal level getting to know the other board directors. Um, I really think that that's important for team building. And um, when you can get to know somebody on a personal level and know their path that they've been on, that's what guides our opinions and our perspectives. And so being able to have that, um, that was invaluable. And it was great. And they were very welcoming of me as the team board director, so that was awesome as well. Um, and then I actually met with um, Aiden, who's one of the um, writers for the paper at DC High School. I met with her last Friday, and she did an interview. So if you subscribe to that paper, you can actually um, in May, there's going to be something about me in there. Um, but we met in the library at um, DC High School, and on my way out, there was a bulletin board that they did and it was poetry around the world and students got to you know look and make sure that the country that they wanted to um represent wasn't already chosen and then they got to pick a piece of poetry that they could identify with and that they wanted to share with others and um you know for me poetry is very personal if you write it or you read it um, it invokes emotion and um, can help drive you towards um, endeavors in your own life. And so it was really neat to get to see what the students chose to show everybody else. A little piece of them, even if they weren't the ones writing it, it still represented them in some way they could identify with it. And um, it was it was beautiful. So if you get a chance to go through the library there and look at it and read it um, and see what the students are choosing, it, it was it was really great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I didn't go to Orlando. I had to give it up to pre require my own. Um, but, but I was the first one to go, I think, several years ago to New Orleans. And, and David McVicker would be able to tell you that while I was in New Orleans and while I was at the sessions that like these guys were, his phone was going ding, 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 because I was, every time I heard something, I texted it. So, um, so I understand your enthusiasm, and I, and I think that's really, that's really great. And I'll comment on one last comment about that at, at the end. Um, I went to the district ambassador meeting. I'm going to loop back to some of these things as well, which is significant in that my schedule has not allowed me to do those kind of things um, for the last several years. Um, and it was really cool um, in at several levels in that when um, it was at Brownsville, which of course, you know, one of the reasons it was at Brownsville is like that building is 70 years old. Yeah. Um, everything else, it was, 
That's, that's reason number one. Reason number two was that it's a STEM school, a, a self-declared STEM school. Um, Toby Kubo was the was the principal at the time when I decided to do it. I think Jill, of course, Jill, I just did it without permission, right? Right. right. Or he did it and then asked for, for permission. Yeah, yeah. Now we, we and I already and she and I already talked about this three or four years ago. So that was um, but it was it was it, it, it's really cool. What it was really cool then. What's really cool now is that the fact that they are still invested in that and they are they are doing it. They take it very seriously and they they. they embedded that in their curriculum moving forward and that's very encouraging to see. And it's pretty exciting. And I know that Doug Dow said that all of our schools are STEM schools, but uh, but I think I think Brownville is the leader and um, and is and continues to uh, to impress with that. So that so that was pretty neat. Um I also I also went to the student voice thing today, which is the first group that I got to do. Um, CK High with the uh, with the advanced choir, um, then CK Middle with a sixth grade group, uh, Rich Top with a sixth grade group, and then the um, was it the Pulse uh, Pulse, 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 Pulse Panel at, at Olympic at Olympic High School, which the principal described as kind of a mini cabinet um, for, for students. I, I think the thing that excited me the most, or impressed me the most, or both. Um, was the enthusiasm or, or the willingness of the students, especially those um, in the high schools, to put themselves out there with respect to discussing the uh, the topics that we wanted that we wanted to talk to on the top. The first topic was, and I I'll probably steal some of your thunder, Aaron, but um, was students first, which is one of our core values, new core values in our new plan. And then, and then the second was to discuss passion and, and, and dreams that they might have with respect to our, our vision statement. It was probably a little bit over the heads of the sixth grader. Um, um, for students first, um, we, heard, we heard a lot about school lunches and PE and, and things like that, but those were important. Then, but, but there were other things that, that I won't mention here that, that were equally important and, and equally serious. Um, in nature that they were willing to put out there, which that we will need to follow up on. But with the high school kids, I mean, some of these kids, they really put themselves out there. And what, what's interesting is to see how, especially with that choir, the community that exists and how they look out after each other. And let's talk about a diverse group. You know, I, that, um, you know, there are AP students in there, there are jocks in there, there are, uh, there's not a, a self-admitted uh, um, autistic, student um and it was it was just the willingness to do that i think was very very impressive and i think there were some messages for us as a board and as and as a leadership team that to really listen to what they were saying they have some opinions about what they need um but from us and and um and i think that that word needs to get back to um, us collectively as a board and the leadership teams and um we need to start moving out on some of those things um, I, won't, I won't go into the whole story, but I'd like to congratulate to Kitchen Kohaya. Kohaya is one of my schools um, and who signed uh, letters of, of intent to go to college for baseball today. Um, Dave Carpenter's, I think, is going to Shoreline Community College. They have a pretty good program over there. I don't know how many we've sent over there. And then uh, Matt Bailey. Um, is uh, going to Lower Columbia College. Um, both of them play baseball. That's a particularly interesting story in that the first play of the first game last football season, um, he completely dislocated his elbow, which is, if you know anything about baseball, is not a good thing. Um, but he's back and he's playing and, um, and, and uh, doing well enough to go to college. I think those are neat things. But what I really liked was the fact that there was recognition of it um, I knew it was on Facebook. It was pretty cool to, to see it on that. So congratulations to those two kids. So so here's the last thing. So really cool that you guys came back with with, with all this stuff. All this the way it was David described to me where you brought a lot of stuff back. <laughs> and stuff and it's and it's all up here and, and it's all great. Okay, but it, but I, but I kind of don't. I, into what Denise said about the board. The board sets the culture. 
Okay. And, and, and I think there's some agreement that, you know, based on the climate survey and some of the other things that we've seen, that, that we have some work to do on our culture. And my challenge to the board, and I'll be honest with you, it's taken me 14 years to say this. It's been a long time because it's pretty funny. I asked the sixth graders, how many of you, because I came on the board in 2008, how many of you were born in 2008? The teacher raised their hand. That was it. But, um, but, it, but in my time on the board, you know, come back from a lot of these meetings from Mazda in Spokane or Bellevue, we come back from places like New Orleans and, and uh, Nashville and Denver and, and these places. And, and, uh, and all of these meetings where you're, where you're saying, but the, the talk, we're not going to change the culture unless we have real discussions about it. Can we put it, can we put it on the agenda? To start talking about what the real problems, okay, that are causing the, the culture issues. We have, and we mentioned this to the students a couple times, and we got a lot of head nods. In these, in these surveys, these climate surveys, for both staff and students, we're seeing about a 33, 30 to 33 percent rate of those who feel like they belong, okay, in their school. And that's for staff and for students. Okay, so. In my mind, for the longest time, and, and I'm sorry, I apologize for not, I don't know, having the guts or whatever you want to call it to bring it up. Okay, this board needs to have those discussions. We need to figure out how we're going to go about doing it. We have to decide that we're going to do it, and then we're going to have to do it. And, it, and, it, and, and we're going to have to take input. We're going to have to listen to, I think, some more. Okay, and we're going to have to, to fix it. I came on this board and all I ever wanted was the Central Kids Have School District to be the best school district in the county, and then the best school district in Western Washington, then the best school district in the state of Washington. And I, and I believe then, and I still believe now that we have the potential to do just that, okay? But in order to do that, we're gonna have to change some things. We're gonna have to, we got, we're gonna have to go, and we're gonna have to say this today to these two groups of kids, especially the high school kids, okay? We need to go meet them where they're at instead of expecting them to come meet us where we wanna be. It, it's that simple, okay? This, you know, I, I use this. For those of you who have been coming to meetings for 10 years now or whatever, I, I, I more than once tell it, you know, this is powerful. You know, I, I served on ships that had weapons control systems that at the time were you know, state of the art. They didn't hold a candle to this that I carry with me and I use all the time the information. We need to go meet these kids where they are. Okay, we need to meet what their needs are. We need to recognize what those are. We need to go do that. We need to be aggressive about it. We need to be proactive about it. Okay, and this board needs to be connected or are uh, committed to it. Okay, we're, we're coming out with a new uh, strategic plan. Okay, there's got to be some bite to that. There's got to be there's got to be a target at the end. Okay, and there's got to be a commitment on the part of the, of the school board and of the leadership team okay, to get us moving in that direction. We won't get there in three years. Okay, but we should be moving in that direction. We should have a good idea of where we need to do at the end of three years to get the rest of the way there. Okay. And this group of sixth graders that, that are brand new at middle school and soon be in high school, a couple years down, three years down the road. Okay, we need to do that for them. And those that those that are still before them, they come before them, and those that come after them. And that's what we sign up for. And I think that's what we need to commit to. So thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you all for the board. Uh, really good input. And the passion um, for what you guys want back. Uh, you were part of that. <laughs> for, our, for our community and listeners, I appreciate the board conducting business. Part of um, our commitment when they do learn together is to have time to debrief together. So, what you heard in the board reports tonight was really debriefing and talking and sharing because they don't have that opportunity when they do learn together. So, uh, thank you for letting them process together, that's that's something that is really a value to them. So thank you for that. Um, uh, I'll try to be really quick. Uh, the Oxalotl, they did not share.
share. That it actually like regenerates a cut off tail. We all knew that. Or a leg. We all knew that. Did you know that if you cut their head off, they will regenerate their head? And that's fascinating because it is under research because they do not uh, acquire cancer. Mm -hmm. They can regenerate a head. So it's super scientific and research a whole. That's all I can say about the national and state. When I lived growing up in Virginia, we went down with family in Florida. I can tell, let me tell you, I can tell you stories about walking into a, gra a garage, knowing that we had bought a baby alligator while we were in Florida and we brought it back to Virginia. Okay, and we kept it in a tub in our garage. Yeah. There, there's nothing like walking into the garage in the middle of the night you know, looking to get an ice cream sandwich out of the freezer and not know that you're going to get your foot hurt. Because the so, my superintendent's report is not about that. Because I do want to listen to our public comment. So, so a couple of really outstanding things I have to mention. One is that we were honored to receive the Outstanding Partnership Award, Central Quebec School District, out of all of the West Sound STEM Network Regional Partners, and that is multiple. That's a, a number of organizations and partners and districts that we were selected as the Outstanding Partnership Award. Um, and the, for those of you who don't know, West Sound STEM is the uh, network, it's the organization that supports a network of partners from businesses and school districts and educational agencies, higher education institutions, CTE practitioners, providers, government. Military, community sites, library systems, nonprofits, out of school providers, and workforce development agencies. And so, Doug Dow, Michelle, um, sorry, did I forget Schuler? Schuster, sorry, I have just went out. So, we accepted that award on behalf of several uh, kids out. So, that was fantastic. The other um, award, I want to let you know that on Monday night, Brayton and I uh, and Jenny attended the Wasa Regional Awards in celebration on Monday, where we recognize our very own Jewel Shepherd Sampson, Executive Director of the Kids at Black Student Union. And Jewel received the Community Leadership Award for her work in elevating and amplifying student voice, especially those voices that have been scored for them silence. She partners with districts, including ours, to engage in important dialogue that will help break down barriers and create more inclusive and engaging space for all of our students. And we appreciated the chance to honor Jewel and thank her for this very important work. So congratulations to Jewel. Um, NSBA conference was a very much a learning opportunity and a fantastic time um, for the boards to be with other board directors from all across the country. For me as superintendent to be able to engage with other superintendents and board directors, um, really the impact of uh, what, what is out there, what are the trends? the trends in technology, the trends in governance, the trends in programs to impact and enrich student learning, but also impact the future of our education. Uh, and so I think that that is really important for us to keep our eyes ahead on the future so that we can best equip our students uh, so they can be successful. Um, advanced placement exam, it's happening. And we have about thousand students in our district that are taking AP courses with over, over the next couple of uh, weeks. It's exhausting, it's stressful. The kids are doing an amazing job. We talked to a few of them in student voice today. Um, those students who earn a score of three, four, or five could actually earn credit at many colleges and universities. It was such an honor for me to attend the capstone project of our very own Kazi. She's not here because she's actually competing at DECA, or she would be here sharing about her project, but I've learned so much and I'm also sad in my Aiden's. Um, and it's just impressive and so encouraging to uh, watch a two-year project culmination of the capstone. Um, uh, district ambassadors, we talked about super uh, engaged group and very exciting. Kudos to HR, Paula and Jeannie and team uh, that share uh, around all things business and HR related. Uh, the graduate or the ambassadors loved it. And, um, and then finally, I wanted to say a quick word about our TK Connects correction. Uh, there's a newsletter that we sent out to our community earlier this month. It was a headline in that publication mistakenly read Navy when it should have read Army. And part of this, uh, the reason I'm publicly um, catching this is, you know, we are such a high Navy town, military town, and it did not mean to disrespect or dishonor at all. So this era, uh, era was introduced during the layout and design process. And unfortunately, we didn't catch it before the pieces went to print. It highlights
time had come to pause the retired colonel and his wife now and a former department of defense teacher who are running an amazing robotics club at his part of Dallas. So we have already apologized to Colonel Hobbs and we um, have taken action to prevent a similar mistake from happening again. But we really just wanted to put that out publicly because we definitely didn't catch that. So uh, thank you for thank you for that and thank you um, for uh, uh, being able to sit through um, our deliberations tonight. Well, thank you very much. Uh, there are a couple of comments. Uh, yes, I was to speak tonight. Thank you for joining us. The guidelines for making public comments are available on your website and or on our comment card. Please be mindful of these guidelines, especially as they relate to maintaining a civil and respectful uh, meeting environment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. As a reminder, this is an opportunity for citizens to address the board with their comments and concerns, but it is not intended as a forum for public debate. We will listen with care and consideration, and any matters requiring follow-up will be addressed outside of this meeting. Um, just to let you know, we want to make sure that we give you your time. Please keep it aside. And uh, Vice President um, Denise will make sure that she keeps the time rolling. Do not like cutting people off. We want to hear from you and hear fully what you have to say. All right, we will begin with in-person comments. Here we go. And we're going to start with Terry Brunson and then uh, Dominique Barnett and Don Jeff. Carrie O'Connor, Good evening. Yes, it's Carrie Brunson. Um, I just wanted to start with a quick introduction. Um, I'm here with my husband. We were part of a parent led um, group working with Wahawia um, to resolve. Uh, an issue that came up. Um, I grew up in the CK school district and graduated from CK high school. Uh, I've seen a couple of my teachers here in the room. Um, I have four children. Uh, all of them have attended Wahalia or are attending Wahalia who have graduated. And I currently have a sophomore and a seventh grader attending. Um, we have been in the school district since our kids were young, and they have attended CK school district schools since 2005. Uh, my purpose in being here tonight is to share uh, my experience um, working with this parent led group um, and working to advocate for our head basketball coach, Brian Hunt who was recently dismissed, or you could say uh, did not receive a contract renewal for the following next year. Uh, a group of parents, and you'll hear more from our one of our spokesperson, he'll get a little more detail, but um, we, we were really unhappy and disappointed in this decision and felt that um, it was not a well-informed decision. Um, we worked together um, to come up with a plan to meet with our school admin, our school uh, principal, uh, school athletic director and district athletic director to share um, our disappointment and also advocate for the reinstatement of Brian Kempke as the head basketball coach at Wahalia. He had been coaching basketball at Wahalia for seven years. He was an outstanding coach. Um, passionate about basketball, his commitment, um, I, I haven't seen from any other coach in all the years that my kids have attended school. He, um, he connected with the players, specifically my son, who has some um, other struggles, but he, um, he always made an effort to connect with him, to help him build his skill and ability, to, and also to develop um, character. So outside of, um, outside of basketball, which I appreciated. I really, another purpose that I'm here today to talk about is um, positive that came from, from these interactions with our school community. Did I Chuck Solby will be speaking in. You can email us. Uh, I'll email it. it. Um, but Chad Solby, there's other parents here from this group and Dale as well. So thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank you. Dominique, and then we have uh, Mike. So uh, you both can come up together. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but, yeah. I 
back in October and came to you distraught. An intoxicated armed and trespassed student made his way to the CKA campus. He entered the school when his brother simply opened the door for him. A trespassed student intimidated students and ultimately robbed my son at gunpoint. I stood before you then because no one at the school board or the district office had reached out to us. For emotions, I wanted you to understand the anguish and fury we both felt due to the lack of communication from you. Afterward, I was uh, offered individual meetings with some of you. I followed up in hopes of scheduling meetings, and nothing happened. I met with Craig Johnson, the principal of CK High School, multiple times. He's been empathetic and, and has promised the following security changes at the school. A full security investigation, evaluation of CK's uh, high school to determine potential security breaches. It was my understanding that we would be informed of the outcome once the evaluation had happened and a conclusion was determined. I'm not sure if the evaluation occurred. If so, we were never informed. We were also told that starting immediately, the students and staff would be issued ID badges. Scanning these badges would be one of the limited ways staff and students could enter the school. We have yet to see these badges. We have requested contact info, info of parents who were assaulted by these students, as well as having our son's teachers know that he was the one held at gunpoint. We think that that happened, it's been six months. The school's policy to protect our son has backfired. Your lack of verbal response has allowed the, the narrative to spread that he is a rat. You have missed the opportunity that we had asked for to assemble the school to let everyone know in the school that telling the authorities is the right thing to do. Those with two students involved have been suspended from CK for the remainder of the year. We have no guarantee that they will not be allowed back the following year or the year after that. My son has been traumatized and believes he has no support at school. He's been diagnosed with PTSD. Uh, PTSD. Uh, his grades have tanked, and he has been traumatized with terrorized by nightmares. The attackers still make veiled threats on social media about retaliation, and they can spread pass along threats to other kids at school. To other kids at school, what are we doing? My son did the right thing, and now he's the one suffering. The elected officials, from law enforcement to the prosecutor to the school board, is failing our son. We are willing to help, but we need you to engage us. Here's what we need. A meeting with the school board, including hearing preference. We need another meeting with Craig Johnson. We need a meeting with Miles' teachers all at the same time. We need to know the other parents who are affected by the assailants. How do we know that our school is going to be protected? I heard a lot of talk earlier about our schools safe and we did share so much going on, do they? Please engage us. Just wanted to make sure we had enough time. Yeah. You guys have better time throughout culture and all these great things you're doing. And I want you to feel the gravity, the failure to my son. I want you to hold it. I want you to own it. He knew when he reported being held up at gunpoint that the people involved were going to blame him and hold him accountable. He knew that and he made that decision. He did the hard right thing. And he looked me in my eyes and told me he has seen no change in the school. He does not feel safe. He continues to be threatened through protected free speech of song lyrics that he puts onto the internet, of veiled threats put onto social media, of kids at school passing along hopeful reminders that they ran into so and so and they still intend on shooting you. He has experiences trauma consistently reliving this over and over. Our country, we offer you thoughts and prayers. How can we not fix these problems? How can we not address the bullying? How can we continue to create situations where my kids can't even feel comfortable learning? Nothing. Do I need to go buy my kid a bulletproof sweatshirt so he can feel comfortable going to school? 
he doesn't feel comfortable joining other groups, he silences them. He silences them, marginalizes them. So, you received a gift. Your policies and practices and procedures and safety measures were tested. Nobody was physically harmed. Emotionally, my kid is destroyed, continues to be destroyed. Are you going to take advantage of what has been offered as a gift and fix the solutions? Or are you going to wait until it gets worse the next time and offer people thoughts and prayers? <clears throat> Thank you. We've got Rick Eckert and then JB Sweet, you're on next. I apologize, my update is not very serious. I'll put yours. Um, so, good evening. I'm Rick Eckert from the North Central School Board, um, but I'm here tonight as your representative from District Area 4 for the nominee, Amy Plaza. Um, I wanted to fill you in on the development for our elections this year. Um, as you may remember, um, a year or two ago, the legislature changed the rules in our state and passed responsibility to run elections for the State Board of Education and for the Ele Education Service Districts of Plaza. Now, when they did that, the law passed that those elections had to be done in And as you may know, our elections were already electronic. So um, what kind of needed to happen what we hope to have is not to have to run two different slates, one election for WASA, the electronic, one for those on paper. So this legislative session, there was a technical bill fix proposed through to allow us, WASA, to hold those elections electronically. I'm happy to report that technical bill passed both houses unanimously. And so this year, we will be having all four of our electoral slates, um, all electronic. That means uh, what you will see is a uh, fully electronic ballot where candidates can go to the WASA site. They can get all the information on how to file for those positions, how to uh, act to actually file some candidate statements, just like we do for our school boards. And then uh, we will get our electronic ballot to our school email addresses, the ones we provide to WASA. Go to electronic, we'll have candidate statements. They'll see who you're voting for, just like voters who vote for us. And then uh, in addition to that, I'm going to do the plug that I've done through email. Then I don't have to ask that we vote. You know, we, we ask the voters to vote for us, but it's important that we vote for our election. So that's our, our area, for the WASA board, the state board, and for the ESP boards. You know, we are traditionally not very good at voting for ourselves. Um, we saw the paper highs last year um, with the electronic ballot for the WASA what we want to do even better this year. Um, our district area, I remember, we were bronze in the state. We were third highest in the state. I, as your nominating committee rep, want to get us up to at least silver. It's an extra goal. We should be the best. We need to vote, vote for our own. And then uh, if I have time, I will throw out there. Um, our director area four has an opening on the Federal Relations Network Advisory Committee. Um, one of you is very familiar with the work of that committee. I believe you can share. Um, if any of you have any uh, legislative interest working with legislators um, and maybe want to volunteer to be uh, our second VA court rep, um, directly mm -hmm. to from Vermont is a very good one. Thank you. JD. And then on deck is Chuck. Uh. I can dominate. I love you guys. So. Yeah. Variation on a theme. The use of the N word is still rampant in CK secondary schools. Black students and other students feel free to use that word and many other racial and cultural identity slurs without fear of any consequence. Some white students receive the, the N word pass, a written note provided by a black student that gives the white student permission to use the word. This is not a new phenomenon. 
nor is it news. Individual teachers have had to deal with this language situation for years. Absent any real district level support, many of these teachers are getting frustrated and worn down. Why? Because district level and building administrators don't know how to address this toxic situation, so they do nothing. When a student or parent says, the N word is our word, and we can say it, your administrators don't know how to respond, so they don't. The vast majority of your staff are similarly compromised when confronted with the situation. Fear of being accused of being a racist or of disparaging culture or profiling black students shatters the resolve of so many staff, so they say nothing. Some time ago, I asked you, what was your number? Before any decisive action is taken, how many students have to suffer in the oppressive haze of racial and cultural harassment that exists in your secondary school? Clearly, the answer is that many students must suffer. Many have suffered, you've heard their stories. Many are suffering, you have heard their stories. And many will continue to suffer, and you will eventually hear their stories. Okay, so be it, asked and answered. You have district level administrators with nice sounding titles, superintendent, assistant superintendent for student achievement and equity, executive director of student support, executive director of secondary teaching and learning, and they are all silent when it comes to the oppressive and toxic haze of racial and cultural harassment students have to navigate. You have a district equity team, and many don't even know they exist, let alone be able to see that their body is doing anything of consequence. And building administrators at the secondary level are afraid to even engage their staffs in the courageous conversations around the toxic atmosphere in their building. Administrators do not seem to know the level of staff frustration, concerns, and fears. When individuals have gone to building administrators, their concerns are dismissed and or administrators get defensive and sometimes double down on poorly planned activities or bad decisions. The bottom line is simple. If you, have, if you the board have confidence in district and building leadership, why do you tolerate their inaction on a problem they and you have known existed for years? If you have confidence that they are addressing the toxic, toxic atmosphere, why are you still hearing the same story year after year? Why doesn't anyone know what the plan is? I bet you board members don't know, know what the plan is. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Chad Salby and then Jewel Clifford Sanders. Good evening. My name is Chad Salby. My wife and I have two kids that attend Kahawia Secondary School. And tonight, my primary and first and foremost goal is going to thank the district and thank the key staff. It's very breathless sharing. We are, our family is part of the Mahalia family that a number of weeks ago were really confused, dismayed, and shocked when Brian Kempke was not reinstated as the head basketball coach. Coach Kempke is a hardworking coach and a good man. And the bottom line is our families trust him with our kids. But I'm happy to report that when we started inquiring and engaging key staff within the district, asking if they'd be open to additional information and other perspectives. We were met with listening ears, respectful dialogue, and a productive pathway to explore if there might be a better decision that was appropriate for the situation. Special shout out to Dr. Prince, Lauren McDaniel, Janiko Harris, the Kahalia AD, and Scott McDaniel, the Kahalia principal. All were very respectful and very responsive. Ultimately, the district staff did make a pivot from their original decision, and we all think that says a lot about your willingness to listen and willingness to reassess. Secondary and small observation during this process, this is not a criticism, merely an observation. We're sharing it in the spirit of more awareness and improve things going forward. And I can speak from personal experience during this journey. The goals and lens of or lanes of responsibility between the district AD, high school AD, high school principal be very fuzzy for our community. And I think also for the coaches that get involved with those stakeholders. It's not that there isn't job descriptions, there is, but the nuances of situations that involve all three roles are not clearly understood. More clarity and documentation for everyone going forward will help. We're not advocating or suggesting that what those lanes are, just merely getting clarity and documentation of all involved. Once again, in closing, thank you for listening, reassessing, and reinstating Coach Kemp. Yeah, uh, Jewel, and then we have Teresa Joseph. 
Hello, I'm Jewel with the Front Line Student Union. And I wanted to say uh, thank you for being committed to student success in various areas. Thank you for acknowledging failure and pivoting to find other solutions. Uh, the Wausau Words was an opportunity to read and hear about the good and districts all around us. However, we aren't close to being done. There's so much more work to do. As Director Green mentioned, there has to be a shift in culture. Uncomfortable conversations have to happen and solution-based action has to occur. Thank you for being open to working with community leaders such as myself and having the opportunity to bring solution to some of the things that are going on. Thank you. Absolutely. Oh, Teresa, and then we have, is it Aaron Oxlander? Normally, I follow the social media on Zoom in the comfort of my home office, but I felt today was important to actually show up and talk about mental health issues. I spent some time over the past couple of weeks checking out the agenda of this past study session. So far, I've gone back to 2018. While I fully understand that there are countless topics that require the board and the administration's attention, I was surprised and a bit dismayed not to see any of those topics directly linked to equity and human services and students of color in the district. And again, that's going back five years. I don't know what the process is for deciding what the focus will be for the study session, but it seems to me that issues this critical could have made it to some of the agendas by now. Acknowledgement of the reality of long-standing issues of living experience of students of color and discussing possible remedies for this situation should have already risen to that level of importance. Well, the questions in my mind are, how much of a priority are these sort of experiences? With equity truly a driving force in the district's inclusion racial processes, how will I know if and when all of this becomes a priority? What do I and others expect to see as a proof of change in focus and an understanding of the urgency of these issues here at the session, number one? There needs to be a full-time upper administration level equity division in the district. The processes, policies, and practices related to equity are too complex, too far-reaching, too time-consuming, and too important to be accomplished successfully on a fractured part-time basis. Number two, we need to hear equity-related language on a regular basis from the board and the district administration. The more you publicly talk about it, the more you will believe in the general need to it. Number three, an honest acknowledgement that what you're doing now in this area isn't working may open the door to a renewed mindset and a willingness to change course. Number four, take time to study at least some of the aspects of the issue. For example, discipline and exclusion rates, and equities with respect to student clubs, the lack of people of color in the district and on the faculty, and the fact that students of color have nowhere to go to get their encouragement and support they need, and the safety and protection they deserve when things go wrong. The time has come to act. Students are suffering. They've waited long enough for change. Thank you. Lisa? Okay, we've got Aaron and then Yukon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Let me make sure, please. Um, if you can start speaking now. Oh, uh, okay. Hello, my name is Erin Ostrander. I'm here tonight to speak to the board and the community to express what it is like to be an active parent and member of the San Francisco School District. I've lived in Kinsa County my entire life, attended Cedar Elementary School. Central Kinsa Junior High and graduated from Fort High Secondary School, as well as Columbia College. Our family is full of graduates. My grandmother included into the same class in 1953. I was brought up with dedication, passion, and honor to support the CK School District. I would like it to be known that I have removed five, five of my children from attending public school in CK. I removed my 10th grader at the request of the remaining 22 23 school year. Due to harassment, discrimination, targeting, and bullying by the dean's student. I think it's also fun. The removal of our student was his only option to continue his education in a positive environment. Documentation and a teacher action has been completed, and after numerous attempts, attempts to resolve my concerns, including meetings, phone calls, and personal conversations and emails, CK High School principal and assistant superintendent of student achievement and equality, and the superintendent. It is my recommendation that each of the board members take a step back and a hard look at those representing and communicating on their behalf. There is a strong lack of communication skills, skills, clear writing, 
competition and professionalism in the, within the district. The result of my experience with the personnel at CP High School is beyond embarrassing. I would not like them representing me in a professional manner if they do so. It is clear that the standards of training of all professionals must be improved, including simple tasks of addressing parents, writing responses, correctly documenting events, and how to send a formal email and how to follow through. Once again, these are simple tasks. My experience reflects uneducated, unprofessional, non supportive representatives, staff, and administrators. If you consider yourself educated, professional, and worthy of running the school district, please take a look at these things that need improvement and look at how you represent CK and our educational community. I've done my part as a mother and parent to support my students in their learning path. Because three minutes is not long enough to address all my concerns, I will follow up with a more in-depth letter to the community for review. I feel as though the ownership now lies on the shoulders of those in front of me to manage the report. It is your responsibility to reach out, answer, and address these issues. As a board, you should support our students and want to improve each, provide each student with the best educational opportunity. I would also like you to know that I am following through with the procedures laid out by the state of Washington RCW. I will be requesting an investigation through OSPI. The actions of the staff and administrators of CK High School will also be requesting that OSPI review and investigate the personnel involved in the incident leading to the voluntary removal of my student. It is here in this room that changes took effect for communities and leadership and that's all you should provide. Thank you. 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 Thank
Uh, during spring break, uh, I submitted a email to the two board members, and since I didn't get any response back, uh, I'm going to read it at this time. Thanks to public reference requests filed by Mom for Liberty to each of the school districts in Kendall County are now available to me internal processes and documents used to carry out CKSD school board policy 3211. Some of the details of this policy are deeply disturbing to me, and out of an abundance of caution, my granddaughter will not be participating in intramural sports or any overnight trips sponsored by the school district. I know that 3211 comes down from Olympia, specifically from Catholic memory via WSSPA and OSTI. Even so, you, as a board member, own this policy because one of the main responsibilities of the school board is to develop policy. As a result, any negative consequences, no matter how unintentional arising from such a policy, fall on the school board as well as the superintendent who is charged with carrying out policy. According to certain forms I have examined, secrecy from parents regarding alternative student names and preferred pronouns is allowed, if not downright encouraged. Such an action is a direct violation of federal law. I am referring to the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, known as SPOPA, which requires local school districts or any other educational organization to release all school records to a student's parents on request. Any state law that contradicts this violates SPOPA as well as the U.S. Constitution supremacy clause and possibly at least the First and Fourteenth Amendments. Currently, I have a FOIA request filed approximately March 9th with the point of contact for PRR request for the Central Kitsap School District and signed by my daughter. And thus far, I haven't received any response back on the FOIA request. And as far as I know from talking to my daughter, she has not received any, re any response either. PRR request is supposed to be um, responded to within five days. Okay. Remember Blue Down County, Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Marie Adams and then Gabriella. So um I want to thank the parents for being brave and making this something that the public can see in here. And it's one of the reasons why my kids are not public anymore. My son has had enough trauma in his life to let the students experience it in the building. So my question to you tonight is, how brave are you? Are you Simi Bird brave? That is a board director at a bird school school district stood up to do what the parents asked him to do. Are you brave enough to protect all of the students? My guess is from two years, no, not. So because of policy 3211 and because of school of our kids are now in the crosshairs of statewide legislation that has the potential of removing children from their parents. House Bill 1469 and Senate Bill 2599 legalized state kidnapping to minors. And some people will say, ooh, has vast language, but that is exactly what it does. It gives individuals the opportunity to take a child and put them into foster care or protective care so that they can get medical treatments that they wish to have. Parents might not agree with those decisions because their children are minors and maybe they'd like to wait. I have a friend from high school. Daughters are going through that same thing right now. She wants a divorce. This is in King County. And she has had to fight to get the information what's happening to her daughter in school. For two years, parents have been saying, hey, this policy is a bad idea. But no, this board followed Dr. Prince's social and political statement to the T. You follow WASDA to the T. You follow WEA, which I used to sit on their board of directors to a T. You do not do your job, which is to 
screening policy to protect all. You copy and paste and then move on. Culture? What culture? A culture of bullying, antagonizing students and teachers, and you won't change it. You sat up here and talked for 10 minutes each or more about how this is great for Orlando learning. But Eric brought up the point. Now what? Now what? At what point? A child has to be traumatized for the rest of his life at gunpoint? And you tell me, oh, we didn't even know what to say when that happened in October. Shame on you. Seriously. Our teachers deserve to be safe. Our students deserve to be safe. Our parents need to be heard, listened, and replied to. I'm the board president. I should be getting emails from you, but I don't get them from Denise. Why? Why aren't you doing that job? That's your job. Two years. Two years. Nothing has changed. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriella, and then Kathy, Sandra. In psychology, neurotic behaviors defined by Dr. Preece as the inability to see um, doing over and over the same thing, expecting the outcome to be different every time. Neurotic patterns are always the base of toxic behaviors and relationships. These are the cornerstones of toxic dominant culture. And toxic dominant culture are fertile ground for discrimination and race based discrimination. In school systems, unfortunately, a lot of structures are impregnated with them. Consciously or unconsciously, we use our children in a, a minority group to a seat of red tape and unfitting policy that will. Later amounts to a disparity in education and will translate in a gap of opportunity and secure a better life only for one part, part of the population. You might, might ask, what are we doing in our school systems that are like this? These are a few examples. The school system has no standard assessing in the psychology department for students from other ethnicities. This makes the results of the test they are taking, they take void for them. And there is a test that standardized for, not, for non English learners that would make such a difference for them. It's called the Ortiz TBA team, and it's only $700. Children, number two, children that are non English speakers who enter kindergarten are asked to learn a whole other language, read and write proficiently in the end of the school year, and are evaluated on this with no support in their native language. This is unfair and unjust. I ask you. Would you as adults be able to do it in 10 months? This, um, this is not asked for other five-year-olds from overrepresented demographics. Little children from minority groups that are ELS students are pulled from poor instruction like math with no one caring. This creates a bigger gap in the learning process and they are considered slow learners and that is not true. They're just not supported enough. There is significant lack of structure and cultural competency to support kids from minority groups in their learning challenges. And the ELS department is overwhelmed, understaffed, and undertrained. There is no accountability for staff and teachers that transgress students of minority groups, and kids are easily marginalized. Dane Bowles said, not everything that is faced can be challenged, but nothing can be, ch can be changed until it's faced. Not everyone has the power to dismantle systems of oppression, but everyone has the power to interrupt them. I think that's what we owe our children at least. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. So, Kathy, and then we have Nicole. Thank you. I'm a public speaker, so I'll put that out there. Um, and my issue is two minutes long. Um, anyway, my name is Kathy Bozo. Um, my grandmother, I used to teach in Lyman, was a pre-K high school graduate in 25. My parents both graduated from pre-K high school. I graduated from Olympic. Um, I have a son that graduated from Central Pacific, and I have a current uh, West Texas sophomore. My plan was just to talk about something silly, but I wanted to talk about something that's been almost today, um, but I think not. Um, I guess tomorrow at Olympic High School is Empathy Day. And um, there's not going to be any um, instruction, no classroom instruction whatsoever. 
and I was concerned about that because there's been no parent communication. I never heard anything about it to this day. Um, I'm not sure if it's happening district wide or what's happening. So I just like to understand what exactly is happening with the day of instruction for my kiddo when he shouldn't be in class. We're going to be in school until June is concerned. So I want everything to be free. Um, second, but why I came here originally is these fancy flyers I get in the mail. I don't know, three or four times a year. I'm not sure. And they're great. And I read them. I appreciate them. Um, but they're very expensive, I'm sure. And they go to everybody in the district. Um, a new policy is starting at my peer nothing uh, the second semester where I won't get a report card in the mail for my kids. I have to go find it online. And for myself, I would really prefer to get my kiddos report card in the mail than this. I would like to see this online. You save a buck and send me a report card. So that's all I have. Thank you. Kathy, Nicole, Daniels, and then we have uh, John Jackson. Hi, um, my name is Nicole Daniels, and I, like some women, have been raised in this district uh, with middle elementary school, third year in Olympic. Um, I currently have two students at Isaac Secondary School, a seventh grader and a ninth grader, and I'm here to share my gratitude for Coach Simpson. I uh, just want to love and beyond work and grow the Pacalia basketball program for the players of today and into the future. But as a parent, I especially am proud of his commitment to academics, respect for all, hard work, sportsmanship, and accountability. When this contract is not renewed, it sends a shockwave through the team and the community. As I heard from several of the others in my community group, and with a lot of time, effort, and concern, we did have the opportunity to meet with Principal Rosano, Ms. Harris, and Ms. McManus. And I'd like to recognize the willingness to meet with us and to openly listen. Went beyond being just present, they were listening, engaging, and most, most importantly, they took action to reevaluate their decisions. It is easy to stick to your decision and use coin phrases, but it takes leadership to take accountability and reconsider decisions with a new additional perspective. Thank you for supporting the students of Cahalia and putting action behind your commitment, your choices, and putting them first. And just some additional comments from what I heard tonight is I think there is definitely a divide between what Ms. thinks and feels and perceives and what the parents and the students feel. And I do support continued, we kind of get on the same page. Because oftentimes when we go to administration, we get a different posture. And it would be nice to have an open posture and an open dialogue and open communication and not be always shifting off to this person and that person and getting the same. Thank you. Okay, we have John Jackson. I'm John Jackson. Um, there's a lot of numbers thrown out there uh, as far as the budget and things like that and contracts. And uh, I have concerns. Uh, you talked about uh, the economy. We don't know what you're uh, expecting it does you know things like that. Anytime that you are planning for any kind of help, that's not planning. You need to plan for not having it. So when it's not there, you're set up for success. Anytime you're asking for you know looking for federal government funds, don't look for that because it might not come. And then you're going to fail. So be prepared and, and look ahead for not having those funds. Because as I stated six months ago, we spend money like it's, you know, we got our own credit cards. So um, I think it'd be better for the district for you guys to look at 
figured out, not having those funds to be able to work through that. Also, um, answering people's questions, answering people's concerns. You're, you guys are the board. You need to attack the problems. Don't wait around for it. It's a, all it does is bad news does get better with time. So you need to investigate it, get the right people on it. Even if it happens to be that if you get that kind of sheriff, you gotta get it on it quick. And then my last point was the term equity. Every time I hear that term, all I hear is I'm raising somebody else up, but that somebody else down, creating division. We need to be talking equality. Because anytime you raise somebody up, you're looking at other people going, well, they're raised up. That means that I'm lower down, I'm less of. So, and that causes blame, division. It, ever since I heard that term, things have gotten worse in the school. I, I was a head, uh, football coach 15 years. And I never saw it when I first started. But once that term started up, then I started seeing more bullying, more division. Something to consider, look at a 30,000 foot level and you know, figure out what you need to do. And then ask the parents what you would be the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now we all on? No, we're not on. All right. Uh, we do want to thank everybody for speaking today and thank you for being brave to uh, stand up to the mic and voice your opinion and give your view. Appreciate it. Um, part of us now, board members have before you uh, information on the May 8th study session. Are there any questions or comments? A uh, number of items to follow up with. Uh, definitely some of Dr. Prince taking some down and we definitely follow up with uh, for the and sort of uh, you know we can just have everything that can be sorted. All right. Any other following is any more of a further business? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you once more and thank you so much. Yeah, uh, Nice to see you, Rick.